Thanks for visiting Timeless Audiobooks. Please remember to like, comment, share and subscribe for our latest audiobook uploads. Volume 1, Chapter 1 of The Life and Amours of the Beautiful, Gay and Dashing Kate Percival, The Belle of the Delaware. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Life and Amours of Kate Percival, written by herself. Kate Percival, read by Ariel Lipshaw. Harry Percival, read by Anthony. Laura Castleton, read by Roseanne Schmidt. Harry Duvall, read by Denny Sayers. Herbert Clarence, read by Peter Yearsley. Amy, read by Esther. Cordelia, read by Kara Schallenberg. Margaret, read by Kalinda. Helen, read by Susanna. George, read by David Lawrence. Harriet, read by Abai. Emmeline, read by Elizabeth Clatt. The role of Florence, read by Miriam Esther Goldman. Horace Greenwood, played by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Olivia, read by Liliana Val. The role of Rose, read by Linda Andrew. Eudoxie, read by Nadine Egerne-Poulet. Ralph, read by Barry Eads. Volume 1, Chapter 1. Childhood. I am about to do a bold thing. I am about to give to the world the particulars of a life fraught with incident and adventure. I am about to lift the veil from the most voluptuous scenes. I shall disguise nothing, conceal nothing, but shall relate everything that has happened to me just as it occurred. I am what is called a woman of pleasure, and have drained its cup to the very dregs. I have the most extraordinary scenes to depict. But although I shall place everything before the reader in the most explicit language, I shall be careful not to wound his or her sense of decency by the use of coarse words, feeling satisfied there is more charm in a story decently told than in the bold, unblushing use of terms which ought never to sully a woman's lips. I was born in a small village in the state of Pennsylvania, situated on the banks of the Delaware, and about thirty miles from Philadelphia. My father's house was most romantically situated within a few yards of the river. It was supported, as it were, at the back by a high hill, which in summer was covered with green trees and bushes. On each side of the dwelling was a wood so dense and thick that a stranger unacquainted with the paths through it could not enter. In front of the house the river on sunshiny days gleamed and glistened in the rays of the sun and the white sails passing and repassing formed quite a picturesque scene. At night, however, especially in the winter time, the scene was different. Then the wind would howl and moan through the leafless trees, and the river would beat against the rocks in a most mournful cadence. To this day I can remember the effect it had on my youthful mind, and whenever I hear the wind whistling at night, it always recalls to my memory my birthplace. My father was a stern, austere man, usually very silent and reserved. I only remembered seeing him excited once or twice. My mother had died in my infancy, I was but fifteen months at the time, and my father's sister became his housekeeper. I had but one brother a year older than myself. How well I remember him, a fine, noble-hearted boy full of love and affection. We were neglected by our father and aunt and left to get through our childhood's days as best we could. We would wander together hand in hand by the riverside or in the woods, and often cry ourselves to sleep in each other's arms at our father's want of affection for us. We enjoyed none of the gaieties, none of the sports of youth. The chill of our home appeared to follow us wherever we went, and no matter how brightly the sun shone, it could not dissipate the chill around our hearts. I never remember seeing my father even smile. A continual gloom hung over him, and he usually kept himself locked in his room except at mealtimes. This life continued until I was ten years of age, when one day my father informed me that the next day I was to go to Philadelphia to a boarding school. At first I was glad to hear it, 
for any change from the dull monotony of that solitary house must be an agreeable one to me. I ran to the garden to tell my brother, but the moment I mentioned it, Harry threw himself sobbing in my arms. "'Will you leave me, Kate?' he exclaimed. "'What will I do when you are gone? I shall be so lonely, so very lonely without you.' "'But Harry, darling,' I returned, "'I shall be back again in a few months, and then I shall have so much to tell you, and we shall have such nice walks together.' I succeeded in calming him especially as our father informed him before the day was over that he too was to go to a boarding-school in the city of Baltimore. That evening we took our last ramble together before we left home. It was the month of June, and all nature was decked in her gayest apparel. It was a beautiful moonlight night, and the air was fragrant with the odor of June roses, of which there were a large number in the garden. We wandered by the side of the river, and watched the moon-rays playing on the surface of the water, while a gentle breeze murmured softly through the pine-trees. On that evening we settled our future life. It was arranged between us that when Harry grew up to be a man I should go and keep his house. We dwelt a long time on the pleasures of such life. At last it was time for us to return to the house, and we embraced each other very tenderly and separated. The next morning I left very early, and in a few hours reached my destination, and was enrolled among the pupils of B. Seminary. I shall not dwell long on my school days, although I might devote much of space to them. I was not a popular girl in the school. I was too cold, too reserved, and some of the girls said too proud. I took no pleasure in girlish sports, but my chief amusement was reading. I would retire to a corner of the schoolroom, and while the other girls were at play, I would be plunged in the mysteries of Mrs. Radcliffe's novels or some other work of the same character. Frequently the principal insisted on my shutting up my book and going out to play, but I would creep back when she had left the schoolroom and resume my favorite occupation. I remained at school seven years, and during that time I never once visited home, for my father made a special agreement that I was to spend my vacation at school. It is strange that, considering the prominent part I had played in the court of Venus, that up to the age of seventeen not a single thought concerning the relation of the sexes ever entered my head. I had, up to that age, never experienced the slightest longing or desire, and looked on all men with the utmost indifference. And yet I knew that I was called beautiful, and was the envy of all my schoolfellows. I have not yet given a description of myself to the reader, and it is nothing but right that I should do so. At the age of seventeen my charms were well developed, and although they had not attained the ripe fullness which a few years later was the admiration and delight of all my adorers, still I possessed all the insignia of womanhood. In stature I was above the medium height, my hair was a dark auburn and hung in massive bands on a white neck. My eyes were a deep blue, and possessed a languishing, voluptuous expression. They were fringed with long, silky eyelashes, and arched with brows so finely penciled that I have often been accused of using art to give them their graceful appearance. My features were classically regular, my skin of dazzling whiteness, my shoulders were gracefully rounded and my bust faultless in its contours. My more secret charms I shall describe at some future time, when I shall have to expose them to the reader's gaze. I have said that up to the age of seventeen I had never experienced the slightest sexual desire. The spark of voluptuousness which has ever since burnt so fiercely in my breast was destined to be lighted up by one of my own sex. Yes, dear Laura, it was you who first taught me the delights and joys of love. It was you who first kindled that flame of desire that has caused me to experience twelve years of delirious bliss. It was to your gentle teaching, sweet friend, that I owe my initiation in all the mysteries of the court of Venus. It was your soft hand that pointed out to me that path of pleasure, and all the delight shown on the wayside. The incident happened in this manner. About three months before I left school, we were told one morning that a new music and French teacher would take her abode in B. Seminary the next day. We were all extremely anxious to see her, and at the expected hour she made her appearance. Her name was Laura Castleton, and her father lived in St. Mary's County, Maryland. She was a brunette, about twenty years of age, and one of the most beautiful girls I ever saw. 
She was nearly as tall as myself, but considerably stouter, and her body was molded in a most exquisite manner. Although her eyes were very black and her hair like the raven's plume, her skin was as white as alabaster. Her teeth were as regular as if they had been cut of a solid piece of ivory, and her hands and feet were fairy-like in their proportions. I was the eldest girl in the school, and Laura immediately made me her companion. She was exceedingly intelligent, well-educated, and well-read. I was soon attracted to her, and we became inseparable. We would pass all our spare time reading to each other, or in conversation on literary subjects. I agreed to love her with my whole heart, and was never happy outside of her company. Laura, I said to her one day, when we were walking on the playground with our arms around each other's waist, why can't we sleep together? Would you like it, Kate? she asked, bending her black eyes upon my face with a peculiar gloom in them which sent the blood rushing to my cheeks. But why and wherefore I did not know. Indeed I would, Laura. It would be so nice to lie in your arms all night. Well, darling, I will ask Miss B. I have no doubt that she will give her consent. The lovely girl drew me towards her, and gave me a warmer kiss than she had ever before bestowed upon me. The contact of her easy lips to mine sent an indefinable thrill through my body which I had never experienced before. In the evening she informed me that she had spoken to Mrs. B., and that the latter had consented that we should sleep together. I was overjoyed at this news, and longed for night to come so that I might recline in my darling's arms. At last the hour of bedtime arrived, and I followed Laura to her chamber. She put the lamp on the dressing-table, and, kissing me affectionately, bade me undress myself quickly. We began our toilette for the night. I was undressed first, and having put on my nightgown, I sat down on the side of the bed and watched Laura disrobing herself. After she had removed her dress and her petticoats, I could not help being struck with her resplendent charms. Her chemise had fallen off her shoulder, beautifully rounded, and two globes of alabaster reposed on a field of snow. She appeared to be entirely unaware that I was watching her, for she sat down on a chair exactly in front of me, and, crossing one leg over the other, she began to remove her garters and stockings. This attitude raised her chemise in front, and allowed me to have a full view of her magnificently formed limbs. I even caught sight of her voluptuous thighs. Laura caught my eye. "'What are you gazing at so earnestly?' she asked. "'I am gazing at your beauties, Laura.' "'One would think that you were my lover,' <laughs> returned Laura laughingly. "'So I am, dear, for you know I love you.' "'You little witch, you. You know well enough what I mean. But if you want to admire beauty, why not look in the glass?' for I am not nearly as beautiful as you are, dear Kate. What nonsense, Laura, I replied, but come, let us get into bed. So saying, I jumped between the sheets and was followed almost immediately by Laura, who first, however, placed the lamp on a chair by the bedside. She clasped me in her arms and pressed me to her breast, while she kissed my lips, cheek, and eyes passionately. The warmth of her embraces and her glowing limbs entwined in mine caused a strange sensation to steal through me. My cheeks burned, and I returned her kisses with an ardor that equaled her own. "'How delightful it is to be in your arms, dear Laura!' I exclaimed. "'Do you really like it?' she replied, pressing me still closer to her. At the same time our night-dresses became disarranged, and I felt her naked thighs pressing against mine. Laura kissed me again with even greater warmth than before, and while she was thus engaged, she slipped one of her soft hands in the opening of my night chemise, and I felt it descend on one of my breasts. When I felt this, a trembling seized my limbs, and I pressed her convulsively to my heart. "'What a voluptuous girl you are, Kate,' she said, molding my breasts and titillating my nipples. "'You set me on fire.' "'I never felt so happy in my life, Laura. I could live and die in your arms.' I now carried my hand to her globes of alabaster, and pressed and molded them, imitating her in all her actions. Nay, more, I turned down the bedclothes, and, unbuttoning her nightdress in front, I exposed those charming snowy hillocks to my delighted gaze. The light of the lamp shone directly upon them, and I was never tired of admiring the whiteness, 
firmness and splendid development of those glowing semi-globes. I buried my face between them, and pressed a thousand kisses on the soft velvet surface. Why, Kate, you are a perfect volcano, said Laura, trembling under my embraces. And I have been laboring under the delusion that you were an icicle. I was an icicle, darling, but now I have been melted by your charms. What a happy man your husband will be, said Laura. Happy? Why? To enfold such a glorious creature as you in his embrace. If you take so much delight with one of your own sex, what will you do when clasped in a man's arms? You are jesting, Laura. Do you suppose for a moment that I will ever allow a man to kiss and embrace me as you do? Certainly, my love. He will do a great deal more than I do. More? What can you mean? Is it possible, Kate, that you do not know? I really do not know. Do tell me, there's a dear girl. I can scarcely believe it possible that you are seventeen years of age, a perfectly developed woman, and that you know nothing of the mysteries of love. Are you not aware, darling, that you possess a jewel about you that a man would give half his lifetime to ravish? You speak in riddles, Laura. Where is this jewel? I lie perfectly quiet, and I will show you where it is. My cheeks burned and I was all aglow, for I had pretended to be more ignorant than I really was. Laura fastened her lips on my breast and placed her hand on one of my thighs. She then slowly carried it up the marble column and at last invaded the very sanctuary of love itself. When I felt her fingers roaming in the mossy covering of that hallowed spot, every moment growing more bold and enterprising, I could not help uttering a faint scream. It was the last cry of expiring modesty, and I grew as hardy and lascivious as my beautiful companion. I stretched my thighs open to their widest extent, the better to second the examination Laura was making of my person. The lovely girl appeared to be strangely affected while she was manipulating my secret charms. Her eyes shot fire, her bosom heaved, and she began to wiggle her bottom. For some time she played with the hair which thickly covered my mount of Venus. Twisting it around her fingers, she then gently divided the folding lips and endeavored to penetrate the interior of the mystical grotto. But she could not effect an entrance, but was obliged to satisfy herself with titillating the inside of the lips. Suddenly flows of pleasure shot through my entire body, for her finger had come in contact with the peeping sentinel that guarded the abode of bliss, an article which until that moment I did not know I possessed. She rubbed it gently giving me the most exquisite pleasure. If the last remnant of prudery had not taken flight before, this last act would have routed it completely. With a single jerk I threw off the bedclothes, and thus we both lay naked from the waist down. How magnificently you are formed, dear Kate, said Laura, examining all my hidden charms with the aid of the lamp. What glorious thighs! What a delicious bijou! What a thick force of hair, and what a splendidly developed clitoris. Now, sweet girl, I will make you taste the most delicious sensation you have ever experienced in your life. Let me do with you as I will. Do what you like with me, darling. I resign myself entirely in your hands. Laura now commenced to gently rub my clitoris with her finger, while she kissed my breasts and lips passionately. I soon began again to experience the delicious sensation I have spoken of before. Rivers of pleasure permeated through my system. My breasts bounded up and down. My buttocks were set in motion from the effect of her caressing finger. My thighs were stretched widely apart, and my whole body was under the exquisite influence of her scientific manipulations. At last the acne came. A convulsive shivering seized me. I gave two or three convulsive heaves with my buttocks, and in an agony of delight I poured down my first tribute to the god of love. For a quarter of an hour I lay in a complete state of annihilation, and was only recalled from it by the kisses of Laura. "'Darling Kate,' she exclaimed, "'you must give me relief, or I shall die. The sight of your enjoyment has lighted up such a fire within me.' that I shall burn up if you do not quench it. 
I will do my best, dear Laura, to assuage your desires. You have made me experience such unheard-of delight that I should indeed be wanting in gratitude if I were not to attempt to make you some return. I rose up, and, kneeling across her, began to examine at my ease her lovely Mons Veneris. It was a glorious object, covered over with a mass of black silky hair, through the midst of which I could discern the plump lips folding close together. I placed my finger between them and felt her clitoris swelling beneath it, until it actually peeped its little red head from its soft place of concealment. I now advanced one finger, and found that it entered her coral sheath with the utmost ease. At the same time it was tightly grasped by the sensitive folds of her vagina. I began to move it in and out, while I kissed her white belly and thighs. "'Stop, darling,' said Laura, rising up and going to a drawer. "'I will contrive something better to bring on the dissolving period. You are rather a novice as yet in the art of procuring enjoyment.' She took from the drawer a dildo, which she fastened securely around my waist, and, making me lie on my back, she leaned over me and guided it into her sensitive quiver. She then commenced to move herself rapidly upon it. It was a delicious sight to me. I could see the instrument entering in and out of her luscious grotto, while her features expressed the most entrancing enjoyment, and her broad white bottom and breasts shivered with pleasure. Her motions did not continue long, however. In a few minutes she succumbed, and the elixir of love poured down her white thighs. The voluptuous sight before me, and the rubbing of the dildo on my clitoris, caused me to emit again at the same moment that she did, and we both sank exhausted on the bed. I shall not detain the reader with all the exquisite enjoyments I experienced for the next three months in my lessons with the beautiful Laura. Suffice it to say that we exhausted every method that two young girls of ardent imagination could propose. At last the time approached for us to separate and with tears and embraces we bade each other adieu. I returned home, and it was several years before I saw the sweet companion of my school days again. End of Volume 1, Chapter 1— Volume 1, Chapter 2 of The Life and Amours of the Beautiful, Gay, and Dashing Kate Percival, The Belle of the Delaware. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Life and Amours of Kate Percival, Written by Herself. Volume 1, Chapter 2. The Mysteries of a Convent. When I returned home, I found my father as gloomy and austere as ever. He welcomed me with a cold kiss and asked me a few questions as to the progress I had made in my studies. My replies did not appear to satisfy him, and I had not been home a week before he declared his intention to send me to school again. I was by no means sorry to hear of this resolve, for my brother was finishing his education in New York, and the house was insufferably dull. I was at once dispatched to Mont de Salle, a convent near Baltimore. The inmates of the convent consisted of pupils and nuns, the latter acting as instructresses to the former, assisted by two or three priests. I had been in the convent a year when we received a new pupil named Margaret Maitland, the daughter of a distinguished lawyer residing in Baltimore. Margaret was a beautiful girl about my own age. She was rather tall, her eyes and hair were black, while her skin was of a whiteness ravishing to behold. She was exceedingly religious, and spent a great portion of her time in prayer, fasting, and vigils. I noticed that she confessed to a Father Clark very frequently and always appeared very happy and contented when she left the confessional. I felt satisfied that there was something going on which partook more of the flesh than the spirit, and I determined to watch. Father Clark's apartment was situated at the eastern extremity of the convent. It contained a large closet, and one day I concealed myself in it at the time I knew his penitent would visit him. I had been there but a few minutes before the priest entered. He was about forty years of age, stoutly built and rather handsome. He did not wait long before Margaret made her appearance. She looked positively beautiful. Her eyes sparkled, her cheeks were flushed, and her bosom rose and fell, showing that she was laboring under some excitement. 
To my extreme surprise, the moment she entered the room she ran up to Father Clark, and, throwing her white arms round his neck, kissed him passionately on the lips. He returned her embraces and drew her on his knee. The sight was entirely novel to me, and my cheeks burned while my eyes almost started from their sockets, watching what would be their next proceeding. I had not long to wait, for I saw the priest's officious fingers unbutton Margaret's dress in front and deliberately pull it off her ivory shoulders, thus exposing two globes of snow, round, firm, exquisitely formed, and surmounted by two strawberry nipples which stood out stiff. He pressed and kissed her breasts, absolutely burying his manly face between the soft cushions. He was, however, soon not satisfied with this, but, canting her slightly up in his lap, he put his hand up her clothes and invaded the most secret recesses of her body. This action raised her petticoats in such a manner that it exposed, to my gaze, one of her ivory thighs, which was large, well-developed, and beautifully rounded. I could see that he was moving his hand rapidly, while Margaret seemed on the point of dying with delight. After amusing himself a short time in this manner, he suddenly desisted, and, slipping her off his lap, placed her on her hands and knees on the floor. He then went to a cupboard, and took from it a bunch of rods. Margaret remained in the position which he had placed her without making the slightest movement. Father Clark now walked up to her and, raising her petticoats, threw them over her head, thus exposing, in a moment, all her hidden charms to my excited eyes. It was a delicious sight, sufficient to have seduced the most rigid anchorite. I could see Margaret's white buttocks, admirably formed, her two beautiful thighs and exquisitely formed legs. All was naked from her waist down. Situated at the lower portion of her white bottom, between her lovely thighs, I could discern the pouting lips of her bijou, with a line of coral marking the spot where they met. Father Clark raised the rod and brought it down gently on her broad white buttocks. Their hue was immediately changed to a blushing red, while Margaret twisted and turned under the flagellation, every movement revealing more of her exquisite Mons Veneris. While the priest plied the rod, he appeared to be experiencing the most delicious sensations. Margaret's bottom was soon as red as a cherry, but she did not appear to mind the flogging which she was receiving the least bit. When the priest had continued this exercise a few minutes, he threw down the rod, and, kneeling on the ground behind her, he unbuttoned his pantaloons, and out leaped his staff of love, stiff, firm, and with its ruby head uncovered. He nestled it for a moment between her buttocks, and then, gently driving the vermilion lips of her coral sheath with his fingers, he brought his instrument to bear on the luscious opening, and seizing her by the hips, in another moment he was plunged to the very hilt in her beautiful body. When Margaret felt that the conjunction was complete, she uttered a faint exclamation of joy and wiggled her buttocks from side to side, as if to prevent her prisoner from escaping her. The priest now began to move himself in and out of her, and as he did so, I could distinctly see his staff appear and disappear in its warm nest. Every time he withdrew, her vagina clasped his instrument so tightly that he drew out the interior lips, and each time that he plunged it into her palpitating body they were carried in with it. You can imagine my sensations, dear reader, when I saw all this. I instinctively raised my clothes and carried my hand to my own moss-covered retreat, and forcing a finger between the lips, I found it tightly grasped by my vagina, and I imitated all their motions, thrusting it in and out, my eyes being all the time fixed on the amorous couple. The priest was evidently in the seventh heaven of enjoyment. His hands wandered from one beauty to another as if at a loss to know which to take possession of. At one moment it would be her snowy globes, which still remained uncovered, at another it would be her white belly, and then again it was the top of her Mount of Venus. Suddenly his motions grew quicker, his staff entered in and out of the coral retreat so rapidly that I could no longer detect the motion. The crisis came, and with a smothered exclamation of joy they both discharged. At the same moment the exciting scene I had witnessed drew from me my tribute to the god of sexual desire. I cultivated Margaret's friendship after this, and when I was intimate enough with her I told her all I had seen. She blushed at first, 
but when she saw that I could be discreet she confessed the whole truth to me. I found her an able instructress, and was soon even more perfectly au fait in all the mysteries of love, except the actual experience of sexual intercourse with the other sex. She made me a witness of many scenes between herself and Father Clark, and I soon found they were both perfectly adept in the art of procuring sexual enjoyment. One day I discovered further evidence of the great morality pervading in Mont de Salle. The Lady Abbess was a handsome, fine-looking woman of about forty years of age. She was very strict with all the boarders of the convent, except with two sisters named Emily and Fanny Dawson. These two girls were her pets and were always with her. They were both beautiful girls, with flashing dark eyes and beautiful complexions. On the day I refer to, Margaret Maitland came to me and whispered in my ear that if I would come with her she would show me a pretty sight. I followed, and she led me to the Lady Abbess's room and told me to peep through the keyhole. I did so, and saw a very strange scene which I will endeavour to describe to you. Seated on a low chair near a large sofa was Father Price. His pantaloons were down and the lower portion of his body all uncovered. His instrument of love stood stiff and erect. Seated sideways towards him on the sofa I have just referred to was the Lady Abbess. Her dress was off her shoulders, revealing her well-developed bust. The lower portion of her body was entirely naked. One of her feet rested on an ottoman, the other on the ground. By this means one of her thighs was elevated. Father Price had one finger in her lustful slit, while she had grasped his staff in her hand. He was slowly pushing his finger in and out of her warm nest, and every now and then kissing her broad white buttocks which were entirely at his command. But this was not all. Emily and Fanny Dawson were also there, acting their parts. Emily stood on the sofa with her petticoats raised above her navel, thus revealing her delicious thighs, her white belly, and the moss-covered domain of Venus. She was exquisitely made. The Lady Abbess was titillating her clitoris with her unoccupied hand, while Emily's excited face, the tip of her tongue slightly protruding from her coral lips, and the heaves of her alabaster buttocks rising to meet the Abbess's deflowering finger, sufficiently showed the intense delights she was enjoying. Fanny was at the other end of the sofa. She had her back turned towards Father Price. She knelt on the sofa with one knee, while the other leg rested on the ground. Her skirts were thrown over her head, and her head was buried in the sofa, thus elevating her white bottom in the air. Between her ivory thighs we could see the panting lips of her luscious bijou. She was rubbing the top of her slit with one finger, and by the quivering of her buttocks I guessed she was enjoying herself to her heart's content. Margaret and I watched all their proceedings. Their motions soon grew fast and furious, and we were both so excited by what we saw that we instinctively raised each other's petticoats and imitated their actions on each other. I forced a finger in Margaret's lovely grotto, and at the same time felt her finger caressing my clitoris. I opened my thighs to the widest possible extent to omit her manipulation more readily, and she did the same. It was a delicious sensation, feeling her delicate finger force its way into my warm vagina. We kept time with the actors in the next room, and at the very moment that I saw the sperm go from Father Price's instrument to the broad white buttocks of the abbess, both Margaret and myself emitted, and the abbess and the two sisters were not a moment behind. We then ran to our dormitories for fear of being discovered. A few weeks after this occurrence, my father took me away from the convent, and I returned home. Here my time passed monotonously enough, and I wished myself back to Mont de Salle a hundred times. But an event happened which more than reconciled me to my change of life. This was nothing less than a visit from Harry Duval, a cousin who resided in Baltimore. Harry was a fine, handsome young fellow, about twenty-two years of age. The moment I saw him I felt irresistibly attracted towards him but I disguised my admiration with all the hypocrisy common to young girls. One day we were out walking together in the beautiful grounds surrounding my father's house. The weather was deliciously warm, and the birds filled the air with their melodies. I was clad very lightly, wearing a low-necked dress with a light scarf thrown over my shoulders. We wandered for some distance, conversing on everyday topics, when my cousin proposed that we should rest ourselves on the grass under the shade of a fine, large elm-tree. 
I consented, and we sat down. Harry took my hand in his and kissed it. I blushed at this familiarity, but did not withdraw it from his grasp. By degrees he grew more enterprising, and drawing me towards him, imprinted a kiss on my lips. I now made an effort to withdraw myself from his grasp, but he held me tightly. Dear Kate, said he, I love you with all my heart and soul. Oh, Harry, I replied, you have said that to hundreds of others. Pray, darling, it is you alone that possesses my heart. I swear I love none but you. So saying, he imprinted fresh kisses on my lips in spite of the resistance I made. To tell the truth, my resistance was getting weaker and weaker, for I felt a delicious feeling run through my body such as I had never experienced before. He grew bolder, and almost devoured me with kisses. In our struggle, the light scarf which I wore on my shoulders became displaced, and my neck and the upper portion of my bust were bare. The sight of my white shoulders appeared to electrify Harry, for he immediately brought his lips to bear upon them, and caressed and patted them with his hand. He did not stop here, however. My dress was rather loose in front, and he had the audacity to invade the secrets of my bosom. The pressure he made caused some of the buttons to give away behind, and my frock fell completely off my shoulders, revealing to his gaze my two orbs of snow, as he called them. He immediately took possession of them, and moulded and pressed them with his hands, at the same time gently titillating the strawberry nipples which, under his lascivious touches, stood out stiff. I was now completely on fire and no longer opposed him. To tell the truth, I was as anxious as he to experience the acme of love. Harry kissed and caressed my bubbies for some minutes, and while thus engaged, one of his hands was furtively raising my petticoats. At last I felt one of his hands on my naked thigh. A shiver of desire ran through my frame. He cautiously ascended the snowy columns, and in a moment or two I felt an impudent finger in the outskirts of the domain of Venus. I instinctively lifted up my thighs in order to facilitate his curious researches, and soon experienced the most delicious sensations, for his finger had already divided the lips which formed the entrance of my moss-covered retreat. He gently pushed it forward until it was clasped tightly by the warm sides of my vagina. While he was acting in this manner, he kissed me repeatedly on the lips and breast, only pausing to suck the rosy nipples which surmounted the two semi-globes. Although he addressed every term of endearment to me, I was too much excited to make any reply. For a few moments he continued his delicious play, titillating the interior of my mons venerous, while he caressed my clitoris with his thumb, sending a lava of delight through my frame. In spite of all my endeavors not to appear too lascivious, I could not help moving my buttocks in response to his soul-inspiring touches. I felt the crisis approaching. At that moment I saw him tear open the front of his pantaloons and out jumped his member as stiff as an iron bar. With his unoccupied hand he seized mine and bore it down on the menacing object. I seized it in my grasp and began to imitate his motions. This was more than Harry could bear, for I had scarcely made half a dozen movements when my cousin, frantically seizing me around the waist, stretched my length on the green sward. In one moment he was between my thighs, which I am willing to confess were opened wide enough to receive him, and in another moment his instrument had penetrated the lips of my most secret charms, and was embedded to the very hilt in my body. Oh, God! The ecstasy I felt when the conjunction was complete I can never describe. He reposed for a moment or two in this condition, and then began to gently heave his buttocks. I responded with a corresponding motion, and no tongue can tell the delights I enjoyed as his delicious staff rushed in and out of the sheath designed by nature to receive it. "'Oh, Harry!' I exclaimed. "'This is too much! I am suffocating with pleasure! Darling! Dar! Dar!' The crisis came. A flood of rapture escaped from me while I felt his copious discharge lubricate the very mouth of my womb. I absolutely fainted with pleasure. When I recovered my senses, I found that Harry was drying me with his pocket-handkerchief. This done, he stooped and imprinted a kiss on the sheath of his joys, and then assisted me to rise. 
we then returned to the house fully satisfied with our delightful experiences darling kate said he as we reached the door leave the door of your bedchamber open to-night i pressed his hand as a sign of affirmation and we separated you can easily imagine dear reader how anxiously i waited for night my bedroom was far removed from any other occupied part of the house and i had no fear that we should be interrupted at last the hour for retiring came and i took up my candle and went to my chamber i did not undress myself but sat on the bedside anxiously awaiting my cousin's coming i had been there about a quarter of an hour when i heard his footsteps and in another moment he was by my side he rushed to me, kissed my lips, and then, with trembling fingers, bared my breasts, which he covered with kisses. He then absolutely tore off my clothes, not even sparing my chemise, and I stood before him as naked as I was born. In a few seconds he was in the same situation, and I saw for the second time in my life his splendid member, so stiff and firm that its ruby head nearly reached his navel. All my modesty disappeared as if by magic, and I removed my hands which I had instinctively placed over my centre of attraction, and, rushing towards him, seized his burning rod in my grasp. I capped and uncapped the fiery head, and played with the purse containing the two witnesses to virility. My cousin's eyes shot fire, and he began to move his buttocks in reply to my touches. He placed his hands on my bottom and pressed me close to him, and I could feel his staff of love pressing against my white belly. In another moment he had thrown me on my back on the bed, and then set about examining the charms of my person at his ease. His first proceeding was to open my thighs to the widest extent, thus exposing to his gaze and touches the whole of love's domain. He played with the hair covering the hillock of Venus. He divided the lips with his finger, and, seeking my clitoris, almost sent me crazy with pleasure by gently rubbing it. He then turned me over on my belly and patted the cheeks of my buttocks, which he swore were whiter than driven snow. He titillated both my clitoris and bottom at the same time, but noticing by my convulsive movements that I was on the eve of spending, he suddenly desisted. Restoring me to my former position on my back, and throwing himself on top of me, he inserted his staff of love into the pouting lips of my moss-covered slit. No sooner had I felt the delicious morsel pierce me to the quick than I passed one of my arms round his neck and pressed him convulsively to my bosom. I then clasped his loins with my thighs and legs and strained myself so closely to him that the very hair of our genitals intermingled. A large mirror hung beside the bed and I could see our forms reflected in it. I could see his instrument embedded to the very hilt in my mons veneris, the tips of which clasped it tightly. He now commenced to work his plump buttocks up and down. I replied by a corresponding motion, and we kept time admirably together. The thrilling rapture, the delicious sensations of that ecstatic period is out of my power to describe. When I felt his hot pego rushing in and out of my sensitive vagina, I squirmed and wriggled under his fierce thrusts, and I thought my breath would leave my body. At last the dissolving period approached. I could tell it was coming on by his more rapid thrusts, by his half-drawn sighs, by his interrupted breathing, and, more especially, by a peculiar suction which my vagina exercised on his rod. I spurred his bottom with my heels, I pressed him to me, I bit him in the agony of my delight, and, just as I was discharging, I passed my hand underneath his thigh and tickled his testicles. Uh, I am coming, darling Kate he exclaimed. Oh, God, I come, I come. I too, Harry, I exclaimed. There, there, there. He made two more vigorous thrusts to which I responded with such vigor that it made his testicles butt against my bottom, and the next moment we were both dissolved in bliss. He then withdrew from me and lay down by my side. A delightful conversation followed, in which he told me how much he loved me and how faithful he would always be to me. While we were thus conversing I had hold of his instrument while he was playing with my centre of love. In a short time I felt his staff swelling beneath my grasp, and it was soon in a state of princely erection again. We again resumed the rites of Venus. This time he stretched himself all his length on his back and drew me on top of him. 
he clasped me around the waist, while I myself guided his dart into my bower which was burning to receive it. He then insisted that I should pump up his spermatic treasures myself while he would remain perfectly passive. I was quite agreeable, and began an up-and-down motion. My vagina fitted his pego like a glove, and I had not played horsewoman a dozen times before I felt his boiling sperm inundate my womb, while I also poured down my share of love's elixir in such profusion that it wetted both thighs and belly. I shall not detain the reader by detailing how many times we sacrificed ourselves to the shrine of Venus that night, nor shall I depict all the postures and modes we pursued, as I have many similar scenes to depict. Suffice it to say that when we got up the next morning we were both thoroughly exhausted, and pale and feeble from our unwanted exertions. For six weeks I enjoyed sexual delights in every possible form, not a day passing without at least one experience of my cousin's capabilities. At the end of that time he was compelled to return home. He left me with the most ardent protestations of love and devotion, and took an oath that he would marry none but me. I had such a confidence in him that I firmly believed his word. End of Volume 1, Chapter 2— Volume One, Chapter Three, of The Life and Amours of the Beautiful, Gay, and Dashing Kate Percival, The Belle of the Delaware. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Life and Amours of Kate Percival, written by herself. Volume One, Chapter Three A New Scene. After Harry's departure, my father's house grew more and more distasteful to me, and I resolved to make an effort to leave it. One day I went to him and expressed a wish to take a situation as governess. He made but slight objections, and at last gave his consent. I immediately sent an advertisement to the Philadelphia papers and received several answers. Amongst them was one from a Mr. Herbert Clarence, who lived in the village of Chester. He offered me such advantageous terms that I at once accepted them, and the next day started for my new home. Riverside Lodge, as Mr. Clarence's residence was called, was situated on the banks of the Schuylkill, and was fitted up with all the elegance wealth could command. The grounds were handsomely laid out, the gardens cultivated to the extreme of art, and, in short, it bore more resemblance to the residences we meet on the other side of the water, which are occupied by the proud aristocracy of England, than the mansion of a simple American gentleman. Nature, too, had done an immense deal to enhance the beauties of the dwelling. The scenery around was pastoral and beautiful. What it wanted in grandeur it more than made up, with the picturesque view to be seen from all sides of the house. The lodge was situated on a rising hillock and fronted the river, from which it was not more than a hundred yards distant. To the north of the house was a thick wood, containing trees of many years' growth. In this sylvan retreat Mr. Clarence had fitted up rustic chairs and seats, and in the heat of the summer it afforded a delightful shelter from the sun's rays. On both the other sides of the dwelling was a handsome sloping lawn, also covered by fine trees. I was met at the door of the house by the owner, a fine handsome man of about thirty-five years of age. He introduced me to his wife, a confined invalid who never left her chamber. I then saw my pupils, two little girls, the eldest not more than six years of age. I found Mr. Clarence to be a perfect gentleman, courteous, polite, and agreeable. I soon felt quite at home with him. Mrs. Clarence never interfered with me, and days passed without my even seeing her. I pitied poor Mr. Clarence having such a sick wife, for it was easy to be seen that he was a man of a very amorous temperament, and it was also certain that his wife could afford him no satisfaction in this respect. I was naturally thrown much into Mr. Clarence's society, and noticed that he daily grew more tender to me. When shaking hands with me he would press my hand and retain it in his, and when I wore a low-necked dress I observed that his eyes were fixed on my white shoulders, and that when he caught a glimpse of my bosom his face would flush, and a decided protuberance would manifest itself in his pantaloons. Things went on in this way for two months. Then one day Mr. Clarence asked me if I would like to go out riding with him. 
I had always been fond of equestrian exercises, and consented very willingly. The horses were brought round to the door, and I mounted a handsome bay pony, while my companion rode a large grey horse which appeared but half broken. Mr. Clarence assisted me to mount, and in doing so I exposed a considerable portion of my limbs, my petticoats getting entangled in the saddle. When he saw my leg above the knee, for I wore no drawers, a crimson flush suffused his face but it was not one of shame, but desire. He recovered himself, however, almost immediately, and off we started. We had ridden about six or seven miles, when Mr. Clarence's horse suddenly took fright and galloped off with him. At the turn of the road, from some cause or other, the rider was thrown off and deposited on the green sward. Fortunately he was not injured. His horse, however, galloped away towards Riverside Lodge. "'A pretty situation, Miss Percival.' said Clarence, as he rose to his feet. "'Here am I, six miles from home, and nothing left for me but to tramp it on foot.' "'Nay, Mr. Clarence, that must not be. If you do not mind, you can ride behind me. The pony can bear us both very well, and we can proceed slowly.' "'I am afraid to discommode you, Miss Percival.' "'Not at all. Our ancestors, you know, used to ride pillion.' "'I accept your kind offer,' he returned and, springing on the pony's back, took his place behind me. He passed one arm around my waist for the purpose of holding himself securely in his position. We then slowly started in the direction of the lodge. We had not advanced a mile, however, before I felt something pressing stiffly against my bottom. My previous experience made me know what it was, and you may easily believe, dear reader, that I began to feel a strange sensation running through me. Whether my companion detected my sensations or not I cannot say, but certain it is that the arm that encircled my waist was raised until his hand rested on my bosom outside my riding habit. However, I made no attempt to remove it, and encouraged, doubtless, by my seeming tacit consent to his enterprises, he furtively inserted two of his fingers in the opening in front of my dress, and I felt them on my naked breast." The contact of my bubbies appeared to electrify him, for I felt his staff of love beating against my buttocks still more plainly than before. "'Mr. Clarence,' said I, "'this is wrong. Remember you have a wife.' "'My darling girl,' he replied, "'I cannot help it. I am deeply enamoured with you. My wife is sick and unable to receive my embraces. Dearest Kate, be kind to me. I swear I will not injure you.' What could an amorous, love-sick girl reply? I was too fond of sexual pleasures to refuse them when time and opportunity offered. I made no reply whatever. My silence evidently encouraged him, for he now unbuttoned the front of my habit and placed his hands on my naked breasts, moulding them and titillating the strawberry nipples. With his other hand he managed to raise my petticoats from behind, and I felt myself sitting bare-bottomed on his lap. This was not all, for between my fleshy thighs was his instrument, which he had managed to disengage from his pantaloons. He now raised me up slightly, and in another moment his hand invaded my mossy crevice. No sooner did his fingers come in contact with the hair surrounding the domain of Venus than all reserve left him, and, inclining me slightly forward, he directed his instrument and in a moment forced it into my moist and burning passage, and drove it home with a sudden plunge. "'Oh, God! Mr. Clarence! How delicious!' I exclaimed, when I felt the hair surmounting his pubes tickling my bottom, and I wiggled myself from side to side on his splendid staff. The pony now began to canter, and the motion he made was sufficient to cause his lance to move in and out of me. During this exciting proceeding, Clarence was titillating my clitoris in front, and turning my head around he kissed my lips in the most passionate manner. The pony really seemed to have some idea of what was being transacted on his back, for he set off in a gallop which soon brought a climax to our pleasure, for we both discharged simultaneously. He then withdrew his weapon, and we proceeded quietly home, indulging, however, in most delicious conversation on the way. When we reached Riverside Lodge we dismounted and entered the drawing-room. It was unoccupied. "'Darling girl,' said Herbert, "'I must enjoy you once more. We shall not be interrupted.' "'I am yours, dear Herbert. Do with me as you please,' I replied. 
He led me to a sofa and laid me on my back, and then threw my clothes up above my navel. He paused a while to gaze on my hidden charm, and ran his hands over the various objects that met his gaze. What magnificent limbs! What splendid thighs! he exclaimed. And what a graceful, rounded and polished belly! And then what a delicious mons veneris! What a profusion of curly hair adorns this lovely spot! He was not content with the unveiled charms of the lower portion of my body, but he must needs release my large and plump breasts, and these afforded him a new theme on which to expatiate. He did not moralize long, but unbuttoning his pantaloons he released his stiff lance, and, bringing it to bear between my widely stretched thighs, I soon felt it forcing its way into my sensitive vagina. I raised my buttocks to meet his thrusts, and experienced the most delicious sensation. His motions grew quicker and the end approached. I wiggled my bottom from side to side. I gave utterance to my rapture in words, sighs, and exclamations of pleasure, and received his whole discharge at the same moment that I myself emitted. When he had finished he leaned over and kissed my breasts, and assisted me to rise. We heard steps approaching the room and I hastily retired to my chamber. My time after the adventure with Mr. Clarence passed very agreeably. My amorous desires were fully satisfied, and I enjoyed a repetition of the scenes I had passed through with my cousin. I found Herbert very ardent and very ingenious in his mode of performing the sexual act. I shall have to refer to some of his experiments by and by. One day I was informed that Mr. Clarence's sister-in-law was coming to spend a few weeks at Riverside Lodge. Herbert gave me the information with manifest pleasure painted on his face, and I felt sure her coming pleased him. For my own part, I cannot say that I was especially delighted, for I was afraid her presence would interfere with our enjoyments. On the appointed day, a carriage drove up to the entrance and Amy Denmead, Mrs. Clarence's sister, alighted. The moment I saw her, truth compels me to state that she was one of the most beautiful women I had ever beheld. She was about twenty years of age, above the medium height, and her form was molded in the most exquisite manner. Her face was really lovely, her features faultless, her complexion fair as peri and marble, and yet the hue of health was on her cheeks, the white and red contrasting in admirable manner. Her hair was a dark glossy brown and hung in natural ringlets on her snowy neck and shoulders. Her bosom was full, voluptuous, and beautifully rounded. Her hands and feet were small, almost to a fault, her carriage was full of grace, and when she smiled she allowed to be seen a row of pearly teeth which, if they had been cut out of a solid piece of ivory, could not have been more regular. When I was introduced to her she received me with a good deal of warmth in her manner, and observed that she was certain we would be good friends. During the evening she asked me if I had any objections to her sleeping with me, as she was too timid to sleep alone. I replied that I should be very happy for her to share my bed. We retired early as she was tired from her journey. She undressed very quickly and was soon between the sheets. I quickly followed her example. The moment I lay by her side she clasped me in her arms and pressed a warm kiss on my lips. I returned it, for I began to feel attracted by this delicious creature, and the warm contact of her beautiful semi-globes to mine sent a thrill through me but we made no further progress that night, confining ourselves to conversation only. She asked me a great many questions concerning Herbert Clarence, as to how I liked him, how he behaved towards me, and a hundred other interrogatories. At last we went to sleep. When I awoke the next morning I found Miss Denmead already risen. I got up, dressed myself, and went down to seek her. I searched the house and found she was not there and then came to the conclusion that she must have gone into the garden for a stroll. I followed, and directed my steps to a summer-house situated at the bottom of the lawn. The pathway that led to it was of grass, so that the sound of footsteps could not be heard. When I approached the arbor I heard the rustling of a dress inside, and instead of opening the door I peeped through the keyhole. Great God! I saw a sight which sent the blood boiling through my veins. Herbert Clarence was reclining on his back on a divan which he had drawn into the middle of the floor. His pantaloons were slipped down to his heels, leaving the whole of the lower portion of his body uncovered. 
straddling him, with one foot resting on the ground and with the other on the divan was the beautiful Amy. Her dress was open in front, leaving her splendid breasts entirely bare. Her petticoats were elevated above her navel and thrown behind her white belly, her voluptuous thighs, her magnificent limbs, and above all that masterpiece of nature, her lovely Mons Veneris entirely exposed to my gaze, for she stood directly facing me. His instrument had penetrated the luscious lips of her slit. While I was watching he gave one tremendous heave upwards with his buttocks and sent it into her body clear up to his testicles. She was evidently gorged with delight and enraptured, for her lovely face expressed the most intense enjoyment, and by the quivering of her eyelids I felt assured the crisis would soon come. They now commenced to move together, he directing his thrusts upwards while she worked her bottom in reply to his motions. While this delicious play was going on, I could distinctly see his staff entering in and out of her coral sheath the lips of which embraced it so tightly that they seemed to be afraid it should escape from them. It was the most voluptuous sight I had ever seen. As the acme approached, Amy leaned over and kissed Herbert. Their tongues sought each other's mouths and they imitated the sexual act. So intense was their feeling of pleasure that they actually bit each other. The working of his lance in her sensitive vagina caused a suction sound delightful to hear. Dear Herbert, I am coming suddenly exclaimed the lovely girl. These words seemed to increase Clarence's ardor, for he commenced to work his bottom with lightning rapidity, and suddenly giving a tremendous push upwards, which she replied to by a corresponding motion downwards, they both remained motionless, his staff so deeply engulfed in her that the hair of their genitals was intermingled. Convulsive movement then seized her whole frame and she fell on his belly. He was still embedded in her. They remained motionless for ten minutes, when she opened her eyes and kissed Herbert repeatedly on the lips. The warmth of her caresses appeared to reanimate him, and he returned her embraces. "'I must go now, darling,' said she. "'Someone may come.' "'I must once more taste the delights of heaven,' he returned. "'We shall have no opportunity until tomorrow, dear Amy, and I am not half satisfied yet.' He withdrew himself from her, and wiping the throne of love gently with his pocket-handkerchief, he stooped down and kissed Hermons Veneris. He then drew her on his knee and began gently to titillate her clitoris with his finger, she performing her part by covering and uncovering the ruby head of his lance. They continued this play for some little time, every motion evidently bringing them nearer the consummation. "'Herbert, I shall spend if you continue your titillations much longer.' said Amy, beginning to wriggle her buttocks. "'Come then, darling,' replied Herbert. "'I too am ready.' And so saying he reclined her on the divan, and taking her thighs in his arms he drove his lance to the hilt into her body. They seemed no longer to know what they were about. Joined as they were together, they seemed to experience the utmost voluptuousness. Amy especially appeared to be enjoying the delights of heaven. Her rapid movements, her exclamation of supreme pleasure, the trembling of her eyelids, and the convulsive manner in which she pressed Herbert's bottom was sufficient proof of her intense pleasure. A few reciprocal motions and they again discharged. They now rose, adjusted their clothing, and I thought it better to retire, which I immediately did. A few minutes afterwards Amy entered, apparently as fresh as ever, and greeting me with a kiss, stating that she had been taking a long walk. I did not say a word, determined to take my own time to tell what I had seen. That night, when we retired to bed, Amy addressed a few words to me and then fell asleep. When I woke up in the morning she was still sleeping. I turned down the bedclothes and found that the lower portion of her body was entirely naked. Her nightdress, too, was open in the front, leaving her delicious breasts exposed. They were firm, round, and white as the driven snow and surmounted by delicate pink nipples. Her beautiful hair covered the pillow like a veil. Her ruby lips were slightly separated, revealing her pearly teeth, and her lovely cheeks were tinged with a slight color which made her appear most lovely. Her belly was the smoothest and whitest I had ever seen. Her magnificently molded thighs were stretched widely apart, and at the lower part of her belly was her glorious domain of Venus. It was indeed a pretty bijou. Imagine to yourself, dear reader, 
a hillock surmounted with curly brown hair, between which could be seen the pouting lips to the entrance of bliss, folded so closely together that a line of coral only showed where they joined. It was a sight that would have tempted an anchorite. I do not know what possessed me, but I leaned over her and imprinted a kiss on that fountain of delight. I then gently divided the lips with my finger and sought for her clitoris, which I soon had swelling under my touches. In a few moments it grew quite stiff. A shiver of delight ran through the lovely girl, but she did not awake. With a finger of my other hand I penetrated into the coral passage, and began to move it rapidly in and out, while with my other finger I titillated her vagina. Amy, still asleep, replied to my titillations by working her bottom up and down. "'Oh, Herbert!' she exclaimed. "'It is too delightful. Faster, darling, faster!' I moved my finger with such extreme rapidity I could feel her vagina beginning to contract on my finger. She wiggled herself to and fro. "'I am coming, darling. Dear Herbert, I am com—com—' <sighs> She could utter no more, but pushing her bushy mount close up to my hand, I felt my fingers endowed with the love potion I had distilled from her. At the moment of discharging she awoke, and opening her eyes gazed with astonishment on me. "'Is it you, dear Kate?' she exclaimed as soon as she could recover her breath. She seemed suddenly to remember and hesitated to finish her sentence. "'You thought it was Herbert Clarence,' I remarked. The lovely girl blushed but made no reply. "'I saw your proceedings with him yesterday in the arbor,' I continued. "'But do not be alarmed, dear Amy, for I am willing to confess he has done exactly the same thing to me.' "'If that be the case, there need be no reserve between us,' replied Amy and raising from her reclining posture she seized me by the waist, and throwing me on the bed she divested me of my chemise almost before I knew what she was about. When she saw my naked body she uttered an exclamation of pleasure and ran her hands rapidly over my charms. She first of all kissed and moulded my bubbies, sucking the very nipples. From this she descended to my belly, smoothing it down with her soft hand. At last she attacked me in the very center of pleasure, running her fingers on the hair surmounting my mons veneris, opening the lips and gazing curiously in the ruby cavity. Then she seized on my clitoris, exciting it with her lascivious touches, and at last, as if unable to control herself longer, she forced a finger into the deepest recesses of my vagina and commenced to move it rapidly in and out. "'Amy! Amy!' I exclaimed. "'You are killing me with pleasure!' "'Have you not given me the most intense enjoyment this morning, and shall I not be equally kind to you? But stay, darling,' she continued. "'I have something that will give you even greater delight.' She suddenly desisted from her manipulations, and, running through her trunk, took from it an india-rubber dildo, shaped exactly like a man's instrument. "'This is what I amuse myself with when alone.' said she. And now I am going to give you a taste of it. Place yourself on your knees, dear Kate, and recline your head on the pillow. I placed myself in the position she indicated, by which means my buttocks were elevated high in the air. How glorious you look in this position, Kate, said Amy, pressing her hands over my bottom. What a pretty object is your bayou between your swelling thighs. How closely the plump lips come together, and how delicately they are shaded by the curling hair growing on that precious buttock. I must, I must kiss it. So saying, she stooped down and imprinted a long kiss on the object presented to her regard. Nay, she did more, for I actually felt her tongue divide the mysterious portals of Venus and penetrate into the most secret recesses of my covered way of love, rendering me almost crazy with the delicious titillation. She was one of the most lascivious girls I ever met with, and evidently enjoyed one of her own sex almost as much as she did one of the male kind. She moved her tongue rapidly for a few moments, and I verily believed, had she continued five seconds longer I should have spent in her mouth. But she suddenly ceased. "'Now, darling, for something more substantial,' she exclaimed, and bringing the point of the dildo to the entrance of my vagina, she suddenly plunged it to the very hilt into my glowing sheath. She now commenced to move it in and out of me somewhat slowly, as if for the purpose of prolonging my exquisite feelings. Soon, however, she saw by the motion of my buttocks that I was on the eve of discharging, and placing her hand scientifically between my thighs, 
she titillated my clitoris and bottom at the same moment, while with the other hand she drove the dildo with lightning rapidity into my lustful cavity. I could hold out no longer. "'I must come, dearest Amy,' I gasped. "'There, there, there!' And with a half-murmured ejaculation of pleasure, I poured down a flood of love's tide and sank motionless on my belly in the bed. In a few minutes I recovered, and we both lay side by side. Again and again we tasted bliss in each other's arms. I sought to repay her for the delight she had afforded me, and I may say I succeeded. At last we were unable to do anything more and fell asleep in each other's arms. We were awakened by a tap at the door. Amy rose up and ran to open it, and who should be there but Mr. Clarence? A few hurried whispers ensued between them, then Herbert stepped into the room. "'Dear Kate,' said he, coming to me as I lay in bed, "'Amy has informed me that you have come to a good understanding together, and I need not tell you how much gratified I am to hear it. God forbid that two such beautiful girls should be rivals. I love you both, and I believe I can satisfy you both. My wife to-morrow goes to Philadelphia to spend a few days. There is no reason we should not enjoy pleasure altogether.' I propose that to-morrow evening shall be our initiation. We shall have the house entirely to ourselves. Do you consent, Kate? Willingly, I replied, jumping up from my bed, regardless of the exposure of my person, and throwing my arms around his neck, I kissed him on the lips. What do you say, Amy? Do you consent? I shall like it most of all things, replied his sister-in-law, following my example. As we both hung about his neck, he pressed us to him, and the sight of our naked charms evidently affected him, and I thought he would then and there give us proof of his prowess. But he controlled himself, and advised us to husband our strength for the following night as he intended to do. He then kissed us both and retired from the chamber. End of Volume 1, Chapter 3「Volume 1, Chapter 4 of The Life and Amours of the Beautiful, Gay, and Dashing Kate Percival, The Bell of the Delaware. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Life and Amours of Kate Percival, written by herself. Volume 1, Chapter 4. An Orgy. The next day at two o'clock, Mrs. Clarence and her two children started for Philadelphia, leaving Amy, Mr. Herbert, and myself the sole occupants of Riverside Lodge. We passed a delightful afternoon together, wandering about the grounds, reading amorous books, and filling up intervals with tender conversation. I found Amy to be a very intelligent girl who conversed on almost every subject. We stayed out in the open air until it began to grow dark. Then we all re-entered the house. We then sat down to a delicious repast, followed by a bottle or two of champagne. The wine caused our eyes to sparkle and unloosened our tongues. "'Come, girls,' said Herbert, rising from his chair after we had finished dessert. "'Follow me, and I will conduct you to the room destined to be the theatre of our joys.' We obeyed, and he led us to a part of the house I had never visited before. At the end of a passage he unlocked a door, and ushered us into a magnificently furnished chamber. In fact, it was furnished with a luxury which I had never before imagined. The apartment was of octagon shape, and was lighted by a chandelier which hung from the ceiling, suspended therefrom by silver chains. The ceiling itself was beautifully frescoed, and was painted with scenes from heathen mythology. Placed here and there throughout the chamber were statuettes made of Parian marble, which almost seemed to breathe in the soft artificial light. The floor was covered with a gorgeous medallion carpet, and around the walls were placed easy chairs and sofas of the most costly description. A peculiar intoxicating perfume was shed through the room, which had the effect of inducing a soft languor. There were eight panels formed by the octagon shape of the room. The upper portion of each panel was filled by a beautifully executed oil painting, the lower portion by a mirror or plate glass descending to the floor. Each painting was numbered from one to eight, 
and they were such exciting subjects and so beautifully executed that I cannot refrain from giving a description of them to the reader. Number one represented a beautiful girl reclining on a sofa, her petticoats raised to reveal the lower portion of her body. Her head was thrown back, her breasts were bare, and her thighs were elevated in the air. In front of her was a young man with the insignia of his sex proudly elevated, menacing the domain of Venus with his formidable weapon. Another girl, seated on the sofa behind him, was endeavouring to pull him away from her more fortunate companion. Her clothes, too, were raised above her navel, revealing all the secrets of her person. The artist had painted her charms so perfectly that it was difficult to believe they were not real. The lips of her slit and the hair surmounting the hillock of Venus was done to the very life. This picture was labelled The Dispute. Number two, labelled A Water Party, represented a boat gliding down a silver stream. On the edge of the boat sat a man entirely naked, with a girl in the same condition in his arms. Her arms encircled his neck while he grasped her around the body. Her thighs were wrapped tightly around his loins, while his instrument was buried to the very hilt in her salacious slit. In the water, a girl was resting on her hands, her plump bubbies just kissing the stream, while behind her stood a man with her legs in his grasp, his staff of love deeply embedded in her sensitive vagina. The lips of her bijou were beautifully depicted at the lower part of her white bottom. Another nymph was getting into the boat with her back turned to the spectator, thus showing the glorious slope of her back and her voluminous white buttocks and thighs. Number three, labelled a complete seat, represented a man sitting on the edge of a low wall, a lovely girl completely in a state of nature in his lap. She sat sideways. One of her thighs rested on his arm, the other hung down. The elevation of her thigh enabled the spectator to see his pego, hovering between the lips of the warm nest destined by nature to receive it. Number four, entitled Rural Felicity, depicted a beautiful girl seated on a rock beside a stream of water. She was naked, as also was her companion, a stalwart man who kneeled over her belly, in such a manner that he had placed his staff between her bubbies, which she squeezed together for the purpose of holding it tightly in position. Below his buttocks could be seen the whole of her domain of love, his bottom resting on the hairy mount. Number five, entitled Mutual Enjoyment, represented a man and a woman lying on a couch together, but in reversed position. The man's tongue had penetrated into her lustful cavity, while she had his engine in her mouth, at the same time tickling his testicles with her fingers. Number six, labelled Garden Studies, represented a beautiful flower garden, in the midst of which was a man seated on a rustic bench. A girl was standing over him with her clothes raised up, and his rod was just entering her sheath at the same time that he was titillating her clitoris with his finger. Number seven, labelled A Scene in the Rocky Mountains, represented a naked nymph seated on a rock, while in front of her stood her lover with her thigh resting on his arms. She had seized his weapon, and was just forcing it into her lascivious cavity. A short distance off was another girl, also seated, amusing herself with a dildo which she had embedded in her sheath. Number eight, entitled A Kitchen Scene, represented a naked man embracing a girl from behind. Her head rested on an ottoman placed on a bench, her thighs rested on his shoulders, and he was kissing her bottom moulding her breasts and driving into her vagina all at the same time. The reader can imagine how the sight of these lascivious pictures acted upon two such excitable girls as we were. I forgot to mention that in the centre of the apartment was a long divan, evidently made purposely for the sexual act. It was perfectly certain from our sparkling eyes, from our heightened colour, and from our trembling limbs that we were almost crazy with desire and that we were ready to do anything to appease our passions. Still there was for a moment or two a kind of restraint as to who should begin. Amy was the first to break. "'We have come here to enjoy ourselves,' she exclaimed. "'Let us lose no time. I propose the first thing we do is to strip ourselves entirely naked.' "'Agreed,' I returned, commencing to unfasten my frock, and in a few moments we had divested ourselves of every particle of clothing. When we all three stood naked, we saw our forms reflected over and over again in the mirrors. 
Herbert came up to us and clasped us both in his arms. He kissed us all over. Now it was our bubbies, now it was our whole bellies, now it was the center of love itself, until we were all so excited that the consummation could no longer be delayed. Amy, indeed, was beyond herself, for she threw herself on her back on the divan, and, opening her white thighs to the widest extent, begged for someone to come and give her relief. "'If someone does not come and quench the fire burning in me, I shall die,' said she. "'My slit is on fire. Come, Clarence. Drive your delicious pego into my vitals. See, I open the door for you. Come, darling, come.' And the voluptuous girl, with her finger and thumb, opened the lips of her coral sheath and showed up the pink interior. Who could resist such an appeal as this? Certainly not Herbert, for he rushed to the suffering girl, and in a moment his pego was knocking at the mouth of her womb, embedded to the very hair in her salacious cavity. Great God, what a delicious sight it was! Amy was crazy with delight. She folded her legs and thighs around his loins and jutted up her mons veneris to meet his thrusts. They had already commenced to move together when Amy suddenly called to me. "'Come here, Kate,' said she. "'You must have your share, too. Just turn your bottom towards me and straddle across my face.' I did as she requested, and my position was such that my notch came directly over her mouth. "'Now, Herbert,' said Amy, "'I will titillate her clitoris with my tongue while you imitate the sexual act with your tongue.' I threw my arms around Herbert's neck. He brought his face to mine, and his tongue penetrated my lips. In the meantime I could feel Amy's tongue seek out my clitoris, which she no sooner found than she began to titillate it in the most entrancing manner. I was gorged with love, and so was Amy, for I could feel her whole body shiver with her delicious sensations. Herbert began to drive most furiously into her body. Amy kept time with her tongue in my slit. We were much too excited to be able to prolong this scene. The crisis soon arrived. Amy's burning womb received Herbert's boiling sperm, while she responded in such profusion that it actually ran down her white thighs. Nor was I behind, for Amy's tongue brought down for me a copious shower of the elixir of love. This exciting scene over, we all took a bath, which was conveniently situated in an adjoining chamber, and, partaking of a few glasses of champagne, we rested ten minutes. "'Come, dear Kate,' said Clarence. "'It is your turn now.' And throwing himself on his back on the divan, he drew me on top of him. In another moment his engine of love had penetrated my slit, and I felt it rubbing one side of my sensitive vagina. Amy stationed herself behind us, and watched with flushing eyes and heightened color the in-and-out motion of his pego into my body. At last, unable to control herself any longer, she passed one hand between our bellies and titillated my clitoris, while with her other hand she tickled alternately my bottom and his testicles. Soon, however, she changed her tactics, and applied some vigorous slaps on my broad buttocks, turning the white cheeks into a rosy hue. Each time she struck me, it seemed to impale me on his fiery staff, causing it to enter a prodigious way into my mount. I insisted that Clarence should remain perfectly passive while I did all the work, and I can assure the reader that I moved my buttocks in fine style. The mirrors around us reflected our actions, and not only was I feeling gratified, but, owing to their agency, I could see his weapon entering in and out of my coral crevice. It was a delicious sight and enhanced our pleasures tenfold. I was, however, so full of love's juices that I could hold back no longer. "'I am coming, dear Herbert!' I exclaimed. "'Come at the same time that I do, darling. Come, come, come!' I could perceive that Herbert was responding to my invocation, for he suddenly heaved up his buttocks, and, placing his two hands on my bottom, he pressed me so closely to him that the hair surrounding our private parts was mingled in one mass together, and I could feel his hot semen rush into me, meeting my own discharge which I emitted most copiously. Amy expressed herself as much gratified at witnessing our entrancing enjoyments as if she herself had been the recipient. After half an hour's enjoyment of more wine, Herbert's erect weapon, which we had never ceased handling, 
showed us that he was again ready for combat. This time he devised a new mode for satisfying his desires. He had been playing with my bubbies, admiring their whiteness, firmness, and volume. He pressed them closely together, and remarked that the narrow channel thus made would just fit his instrument. He placed me half sitting on an ottoman, and made me recline on my back on the divan. He then made Amy straddle my chest, her bottom just resting on the top of my breasts, her face turned towards me, thus presenting her delicious buttocks to his gaze. He now stood between my thighs, his right knee coming in contact with my hairy mount. He then placed his instrument between my breasts, and at the same time entered Amy's slit from behind. I squeezed my bubbies together and held his staff tight. It was a curious position, but it gave us all infinite enjoyment. For while he was satisfying Amy's greedy crevice with his pego, he was rubbing my clitoris with his knee. We all discharged together. All these experiences in the fields of Venus were not sufficient to quench our desires, so excited were we with the voluptuous surroundings. After a few minutes' rest, Amy proposed the next tableau. She lay down lengthwise on the divan, and made me lie on the top of her with my head between her thighs, by which position my mouth came in contact with her notch, while hers did the same with mine. As I supported myself on my knees, my bottom was raised. She then directed Herbert to enter me from behind. No sooner was his staff embedded in my vagina than she commenced to titillate my clitoris with her tongue, while I performed the same office for her. I shall not attempt to describe my feelings during this delicious combat. Not only did I feel his soul-inspiring thrusts, but the titillations of her tongue almost sent me crazy with delight, to say nothing of the pleasure I experienced from biting and sucking her voluptuous clitoris. We all discharged sooner this time than we had done before. We were now somewhat exhausted, and sat down to a splendid collation and drank some delicious wines. After this was over we all reclined on the divan together. Herbert, said Amy, while we are resting, tell us your love adventures. They must be very racy. Willingly, my love, but it is a long story, and I am afraid of shocking your modesty, for I shall be obliged to use plain language. I tell you what to do, Herbert, said I. Use French terms. That will be an excellent way of getting over the difficulty. A good idea, Kate, and I will follow it. When I want to speak of the throne of Venus, I will use the word con. When I refer to man's organ, I will say vit. The buttocks I will call the fesses and cool, indiscriminately. I warn you beforehand some phrases I shall express entirely in French, as they cannot be translated without offending American ears. Besides which, I love to speak of matters of which I believe you are ignorant for I am free to confess there is no greater rake than myself. We placed ourselves in listening posture, he with a hand placed over each of our mounts. He then commenced his history in the terms which will be found in the next chapter. End of Volume 1, Chapter 4《Of the Life and Amours of the Beautiful, Gay, and Dashing Kate Percival, the Belle of the Delaware. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Life and Amours of Kate Percival, written by herself. Volume 1, Chapter 5 Herbert Clarence's History. I was born at Temperanceville, a village in the interior of the state of New York. My father was a rich man, and the house in which we lived was a fine mansion, beautifully situated in the midst of a grove of trees. Up to the age of sixteen nothing occurred worthy of note. Since the time I was eight years of age my father had employed a private tutor to instruct me, but he was a very easy man and allowed me to slight my lessons with impunity. The consequence was that at sixteen I was, comparatively speaking, ignorant. One day my father asked me to write a note for him, and when I handed it to him he was shocked at the numerous mistakes in orthography and composition, and forthwith decided that I must be sent to school. My tutor was dismissed, and the very next week I was sent to a large boarding school in Brooklyn, 
kept by a Mr. Amis. I soon felt at home in my new position, and liked the change very much, making rapid progress in my studies. I was one of the biggest boys in the school, and having in more than one instance proved my courage, I was spared much annoyance from the other boys, who, although they might surpass me in learning, were not my masters in fisticuffs. A year passed in this manner, and during that period I almost recovered the time lost in my early education. I was a favourite both with the boys and the principal of the school, and the days passed very pleasantly, until an event occurred which changed the entire tenor of my existence. I had often heard Mr. Amis speak of his daughter, Cordelia, who was in France finishing her education. During my second year at school she returned home, and the following day I saw her for the first time in the garden attached to the house. At the moment I first beheld her, she was stooping down gathering flowers. This posture elevated her clothes behind, and I saw a considerable portion of her beautiful legs, the sight of which, for the first time, inspired me with sexual desire. I anxiously waited for her to turn around, that I might see her face. In a few moments she did so, and I was immediately struck with her beauty. She was a brunette with dark glossy hair, intensely black eyes, regular features, luscious red lips, white teeth, a laughing expression on her countenance, ivory shoulders, rather short stature, broad hips, and a glorious figure. She detected my earnest gaze, but instead of being abashed at it, she merely smiled at me and passed. I judged her to be about twenty years of age. I could not forget Cordelia's smile all that day. It haunted me wherever I went. I was too young to understand its real significance, but it was sufficient to cause an indefinable feeling to take possession of me. When I retired to bed that night, my father had insisted that I should have a room to myself, I noticed that the chamber adjoining mine, which had been shut up ever since I had been at school, was now open, and fitted up with new furniture. In answer to my inquiry, I was told that the room was destined for Miss Cordelia. I felt pleased to think that I should have her for such a close neighbour, and I began to think we might become more intimately acquainted. About three nights after this, I retired to bed quite late. In fact, the whole house had already retired. When I came to Miss Cordelia's room, I was surprised to find the door half open, and a brilliant light streaming from it. My curiosity was so aroused that I peeped into the chamber. Great God! A sight met my eyes which took away my breath and riveted me to the floor. The beautiful Cordelia, with nothing on but her chemise, was lying on a sofa. But this was not all. Her back was towards me, and her sole garment was raised above her hips, revealing to me her lovely bottom, the back portion of a pair of the whitest thighs in the world, and the whole of her magnificently formed legs. In lying down she had a curious position, which jutted out her buttocks, and allowed me to see, between her fleshy thighs, the luscious lips of her bijou shaded with black hair. I stood confounded for a moment, but soon recovered myself, as the lovely creature appeared to be asleep. I determined to venture into the chamber, that I might obtain a closer view of her concealed beauties. I cautiously glided into the chamber, and found that she did not wake. I advanced close to her, and, kneeling down behind her, examined at leisure the beautiful objects before my eyes. I can find no words to express her exquisite con. The two fleshy lips met close together, showing only a line of coral, which curved from her bottom and was lost in a mass of black curly hair. Of course I was perfectly excited at this sight, and in spite of all prudent considerations I could not resist bending my head down and imprinting a kiss on the object offered to my regard. She evidently felt the embrace, for a shiver ran through her body, but she did not open her eyes. I now grew more bold, and dividing the lips of her bijou with my tongue, I sought the interior of her grotto and met at the entrance her stiffened clitoris which I had no sooner touched than, as if by instinct, she pressed her bushy mount close to my face. I now moved my tongue slowly in and out of the luscious opening, and she responded by heaves of her buttocks, and in a few moments she poured down a flood of love's elixir. 
I rose to my feet and was about to withdraw when Cordelia opened her eyes and gazed on me, full in the face. I blushed all over with shame and was about to make a precipitate retreat when the dear girl smiled on me and, seizing my hand, conveyed it to her splendid bubbies. I already read my pardon on her face and clasping my arms around her I pressed her frantically to my heart. I kissed her deliriously, gluing my lips to her, at the same time forcing my tongue into her mouth. She returned all my caresses. After toying in this manner a little while, I slipped her chemise off her shoulders and exposed her two semi-globes to my greedy gaze. What lovely objects! I kissed them, sucked the nipples, buried my face between them, stroked her belly and played with her hairy mount. She too was not unoccupied, for she had unbuttoned my trousers, and was caressing my staff with her hand, capping and uncapping its red head, and with the other hand she tickled my testicles. In a broken voice she confessed to me that she had only pretended to be asleep during my manipulations of her charms, that she desired to enjoy me as much as I did her, and she begged me at once to satisfy her longings. I was all primed and loaded for the combat, and kneeling on the floor I drew her towards me. She stooped down and with her own hand guided my instrument into her salacious notch. I felt it tearing up her vagina, and in a moment our conjunction was complete. She now commenced to move her bottom rapidly on my staff, while I, with my arms clasped round her handsome body, pressed her towards me in such a manner that her snowy breasts beat against my face. I took one of her rosy nipples in my mouth, and while she was pumping up my spermatic treasures, I sucked and titillated the cunning little strawberry top of her alabaster globes. Nor was this all, for I lowered one of my hands and tickled her bottom, sometimes gently slapping her fleshy cushions, at others forcing a finger in le trou de son cul. When she felt this last operation, she could no longer withhold her emission but throwing her arms round my neck she discharged profusely at the same moment that I anointed her vagina and thighs with my love juices. I enjoyed her three times before leaving her. We came to a very good understanding together, and it was decided that I should visit her again the next evening, when everybody had retired to bed. I slept soundly that night, and rose the next morning extremely happy for I was cheered up by the thoughts of the joys I was about to experience. I stole into her chamber at the time agreed upon, and found her already in bed. I undressed myself as quickly as possible, and placed the lighted candle at the foot of the bed. I then laid down by her side. During this proceeding Cordelia pretended to be asleep. I placed my hand on her delicious bubbies, and throwing down the sheet, kissed them. She then opened her eyes and smiled sweetly upon me. I placed my hand over her nightdress and raised it gently until I reached her pretty con. I played with the hair of her mount and inserted a finger into her warm vagina. While I was doing this I kissed her lips and my tongue met hers. I then felt her bottom and thighs roving from one to the other. All these touchings excited us both to the highest pitch. I suddenly threw off all the coverings of the bed and by the aid of the candle examined all her charms. Cordelia made no resistance whatever, but, grasping my stiff rod in her hand, commenced to move the foreskin backwards and forwards. I kissed her on the eyes and mouth, and addressed the most endearing epithets to her. She was almost crazy with delirious delight. "'Come, darling!' she exclaimed. "'Put it into me, or I shall die!' I immediately rolled on top of her, and in a moment I had pierced her to the very quick. A few rapid motions, and I had inundated the mouth of her womb with a flood of boiling sperm. It would take me too long to relate all the different ways in which I enjoyed the beautiful Cordelia. Sometimes I lay on top of her, at others she lay on top of me. Sometimes I did it sideways, sometimes I did it kneeling, sometimes before and sometimes behind. Sometimes when I was in a hurry and met her in a retired place, I would place her on a trunk, a chair, a mattress and achieved the results in the most extraordinary position. More than once I made her stoop forward with her head and hands resting on a trunk, and throwing her petticoats over her head from behind, I would regale myself by the sight of her delicious white cool, with her delicate con peeping between her white thighs, and releasing my member from its ordinary place of concealment, 
I would force it to the very hilt into her body, her beautiful bottom just fitting the hollow of my thighs. One night I stripped her entirely naked as well as myself. I then strewed a large quantity of roses on the floor, and made her pick them up, naked as she was, all the time watching her by the light of the lamp. The different postures she assumed were delicious to contemplate. I then rubbed some essence of jasmine on her polished skin, and applied some on my own body. We threw ourselves on the bed, and assumed a hundred different positions. At last I caused her to kneel before me, and handled at will her belly, her thighs, her bubbies, and at last, though not the least, delicious, her con, pressing the two lips together, playing the hair on her mount, titillating her clitoris, and exploring the innermost recesses of her vagina. She appeared to enjoy all these follies as much as myself. I then made her incline forward on her hands and knees, and mounted on her back. I maintained this position some little time, then I brought my member down between her two flashy buttocks, and knocked at the trou de son cou. I did not, however, enter there, but opening the lips of the legitimate passage with my two fingers, I inserted my dart into her ruby sheath, and a few in-and-out motions soon brought down a shower of bliss. We now rose up, and, naked as we were, sat down near the fire. I produced a bottle of cordial with which I had provided myself, and the fire of desire soon burned in our eyes again. We kissed each other over and over. At last I took her by the arm and drew her from her seat in a standing posture, and tried to enter her while in this position, but I could not accomplish it. She was so excited that she seized my member in her hand, and, dragging me to the bed, fell on her back, pulled me on top of her, and guided my instrument into her salacious slit. The bed creaked with our motions, but I paid no attention to it, and drove into her delicious body with all my might. She, returning heave for heave, we both soon discharged copiously. We rested an hour, and then I inclined her with her belly on the bed. By this means her beautiful cool was completely exposed to my attack. In the first place I put my instrument between her buttocks, and moved it backwards and forwards in this position. I do not know how it was, but the head of my engine struck against Le Trou de Son Coul. The contact evidently titillated her, for she wiggled her bottom and begged me l'enculé. Without any further ceremony I moistened the head of my instrument, and, separating the two cheeks of her fesses, I forced my vit into the narrow passage. She aided me by every means in her power, raising her buttocks to meet my attack. In a moment I was plunged au fond de son cul. How delicious it was! How tightly was my engine grasped by the narrow sheath! I passed my hand around her belly and put one of the fingers into her con, titillating the lips of this seat of happiness. Cordelia was beyond herself. She lay palpitating on her belly, and her whole body was in agitation. Every thrust that I gave from behind caused my fingers to be buried deeply into her sensitive quiver and the cheeks of her bottom trembled with the shock. Her sensitive vagina contracted, and she discharged before me, but when I felt my fingers moistened, I withdrew them from their warm nest, and seizing her by her hips, pushed my member for the last time into the narrow path, and she drew from me the liquor of love in such great profusion, that when I withdrew my lance from its asylum, the white cushions of her buttocks were inundated with my metal. When all was over, I assisted her to rise, and we were satisfied for the time, for our scene had been a prolonged one. I left her, after assuring her of my devotion. At last the time came for me to leave school, and I lost sight of the beautiful Cordelia. When I returned home I was quite a young man, and my experience with my preceptor's daughter had lighted such a fire in me that I was soon looking about for a means to gratify my passion. I determined that Margaret Murdoch should be the next to receive my embraces, and I began immediately to lay my plans for the purpose of effecting that object. Margaret was the daughter of a widow lady who resided in the village. She was a gloriously beautiful girl, about eighteen years of age. Her hair was a sunny auburn and hung in natural curls around a snow-white neck. She was voluptuously made and extremely graceful. I managed to get introduced to her and visited the house quite frequently. I had frequent opportunities to see her alone, and you may rely upon it I did not let the grass grow under my feet. 
In a few days I had advanced so far as to put my arms around her waist and kiss her. Although at first she somewhat resisted these embraces, she eventually submitted to them, and even returned my kisses. One warm day in the spring of the year I called at her mother's house as usual, and was informed by the servant that Mrs. Murdoch was not home, and would not return before evening, but that Miss Margaret was in the drawing-room. I ran upstairs, and found her seated on a rocking-chair, engaged in sewing. I ran up to her and shook her by the hand, asking tenderly after her health. She answered me with civility, and I took a seat close by her side, and gazed fixedly on her beautiful face. We conversed on different subjects a little while. Then I passed my arm around her waist, and kissed her. She made no resistance, but a deep blush suffused her face and neck. "'Kiss me, darling,' I whispered in her ear. The charming creature advanced her face towards mine, and brought her lips in contact with my own. Before she was aware of it, I gently inserted my tongue into her mouth. This species of kissing appeared to please her, for a shiver ran through her body, and I met with hers in reply. I now glided my hand down the front of her dress, and felt her plump, firm white bubbies, first moulding and pressing them, then forcing my hand as far as possible toward her smooth belly. She murmured a few words of objection to these enterprises on my part, so I withdrew my hand and drew her on my knees. I now commenced to kiss her eagerly, during which time I was cautiously raising her petticoats with my fingers. At last my hand came in contact with her naked thighs. When I felt her deliciously formed limbs, I could scarcely restrain myself, but pressed her frantically to my heart. Margaret appeared to be as much excited as I was, and I saw her direct her eyes to the front of my trousers, which, I assure you, stuck out in a very unseemly manner. "'Someone might come,' said the charming girl. Her cheek dyed with the deepest crimson, and she suddenly jumped from my lap, and, running to the door, shut and bolted it. She then returned to me, and I drew her between my legs. "'I love you, darling,' I exclaimed and while speaking I raised her petticoats from behind with one hand, until it rested on her magnificently formed buttocks. How firm and smooth were those white cushions, and what pleasure I took in manipulating them at will! With my unoccupied hand I seized one of hers and brought it down on my rampant member, which was so stiff and unruly that it was ready to burst the bonds which confined it. Finding that she made no resistance to my proceedings, I unbuttoned the front of my trousers, and my staff nestled itself in her grasp. She was evidently astonished at the size and condition of my member. "'You must be aware, darling,' I exclaimed, "'that this ought to be hidden from sight, and you have a place proper to receive it.' So saying, I carried her in my arms to a sofa, and placing her on it on her back, I threw her skirts over her head, disclosing to my gaze her body naked from her belly to her feet. Ye gods, how I feasted my eyes on the glorious sight! I passed my hands over all her hidden charms. Now it was her smooth white belly, now it was her voluminous thighs, now it was her delicious bottom, and at last it was her lovely con, embowered in a mass of auburn hair. I pressed the two lips of this abode of bliss together. I turned my fingers in the curly thicket adorning her mount, and even advanced one into the narrow opening of her vagina. I was now determined on action, and seating myself on the sofa I drew her onto my lap, with her face towards me, and my knees between her thighs. I let down my trousers, raised my shirt, and directed my lance towards her rubicund opening. I soon felt it come in contact with her hairy slit. I then opened the two lips of her con with my fingers and thumb, and jutting my buttocks forward I felt myself penetrate a little way into her warm vagina. I hurt her, however, a good deal, and she begged of me to desist, but I only altered my position slightly, and making her open her thighs to the widest extent, I again pushed forward, but she again compelled me to stop, complaining that I hurt her dreadfully. I explained to her that the pain would be but momentary, and that when I had once forced a passage, the most delicious pleasures would follow. But seeing she still resisted, I determined to try another mode. I again placed her lengthwise on the sofa, and threw myself on top of her, but it was of no use. I could not enter. I withdrew from her, and began to curse my ill luck. 
I kissed her, felt her con, and advanced a finger into her vagina to see what progress I had done. I found it was very little indeed. To my great joy I saw on the chimney-piece a pot of pomade. I immediately appropriated it and anointed my staff. I now placed the dear girl on her hands and knees on the floor, and throwing up her clothes I entered her from behind. It was now comparatively easy work, and in a second her magnificent bottom was in contact with my belly, my instrument having entered her vagina to the very hilt. I paused a moment to observe the beauties before me, and then commenced slowly the in-and-out movement. Margaret was already in the seventh heaven of enjoyment. Her white buttocks shivered with the shocks of my thrusts. I passed my hand in front, and handled her bubbies, her belly, and the upper part of her slit, titillating her clitoris. At last the die-away moment approached, and I seized her by her buttocks and drove furiously into her. Her thirsty vagina sucked from me the essence of life, which mingled with her own discharge and she sank exhausted on her belly. When she had recovered, I took her to her chamber, which was the very next room, and we both threw ourselves on the bed, having both stripped naked. The contact of our warm bodies soon restored our powers, and we indulged in a thousand follies. In a state of nature she appeared perfectly lovely, and I was never tired of admiring her smooth satin skin, her voluptuous bosom, her swelling thighs, her whole belly, and her delicious mons veneris. She too gratified her curiosity by falling all over my body. She half threw herself on top of me, and gluing her lips to mine, she at the same time amused herself titillating my testicles. While thus engaged, her snowy bubbies beat against my chest, while her moss-covered slit rubbed against my thigh. These touchings and titillations worked me up to such a pitch that I could endure it no longer. I drew her to the edge of the bed, first placing a pillow under her bottom, and raising one of her thighs in the air, I rested it on my arm. By this means her lovely slit was completely exposed to my attack. She opened the luscious lips herself, with her finger and thumb, so that I could see the coral interior. I brought my staff to bear on the inviting entrance and with a single heave of my buttocks I completely gorged her vagina. I rode, however, easily in the harbour, and the dear girl experienced all the joys of a perfect conjunction, without any pain. At first my motions were slow, but as our delirium increased they grew faster. She met my thrust by responsive heaves of her bottom until we could both hold out no longer, but both discharged simultaneously. I shall not tell you, dear girls, how many times I enjoyed the beautiful Margaret before I left her, for fear that you should think that I exaggerate. I only know that when I quitted her apartment I was completely exhausted, and that it took several days for me to recover my wonted energy. I found Margaret adept in the science of love. She soon learned every mode and posture for performing the sexual act, and we had many, many happy hours together. One day we were playing together in the summer-house attached to the house. She began the play of love by kissing me, and forcing her tongue into my mouth she imitated with that organ the conjugal act. By this mode of procedure she illumined a fire in my body, and I pressed her to my heart in delirium. She then unbuttoned my trousers, and, seizing my instrument, rubbed it between her hands. I drew her on my knees and raised up her petticoats at the same time. I let down my pantaloons and felt her naked bottom resting against my belly. How delicious was the sensation of her warm buttocks! My staff forced an entrance between her two thighs, and she leaned forward and kissed it a thousand times, occasionally rubbing it against her lovely con. She even lodged it between the two lips, and by moving her buttocks titillated it in this position. Supreme pleasure began to run through my veins and I was on the eve of discharging when, slightly raising her cool, she guided the stiffened dart of love to the entrance of her vagina, and in another moment I was au fond de son cul. She leaned forward in such a manner that I could see my staff enter in and out of her coral sheath. She moved her buttocks, and after a few violent thrusts I felt her parts contract on my piercer and she pumped the sperm from my testicles at the same moment that she herself discharged profusely. My acquaintance with Margaret lasted four months, during which time we took our surfeit of love's enjoyments. At the end of that time I left to pay a visit to an uncle who lived in the village of B. 
in the state of Pennsylvania, a few miles from where I now reside. My uncle was a bachelor, possessed of large wealth, and it was generally understood that I was to be his heir. The village I have just referred to was a very quiet place, consisting only of about two hundred inhabitants. It contained, however, a church and a clergyman, who was a widower with an only daughter. I first saw Helen Roberts at chapel the Sunday following my arrival. I was immediately struck with her beauty. Her features were perfectly regular and classical. Her eyes were large, lustrous, and dreamy. Her bust was faultless, and her whole form was as if it had been moulded by the God of love himself. I was soon destined to know her more intimately. One afternoon, after I had been at my uncle's about two weeks, I happened to stroll into the church, and the first sight that met my eyes was Helen Roberts herself, lying fast asleep in one of the pews. The day was very warm, and she had doubtless entered the holy edifice for the purpose of resting herself, and, feeling tired, sleep had overcome her. Her dress was slightly discomposed at her feet, revealing a considerable portion of her magnificently formed limbs. I advanced cautiously to her side, and saw that she slept soundly. I could not resist the temptation offered me, but gently raised her petticoats. She wore no drawers, and all the secrets of her charming person were entirely exposed to my gaze. The sight of her lovely white belly, her naked thighs, and her pretty, hairy bijou inflamed me in the highest degree, and in a moment my lance was as stiff as a poker. I passed my hand over her belly, and although a shiver ran through her at the contact, she did not awake. I then gently divided her thighs, and handled at pleasure all the charms of the domain of Venus. I played with the hair surmounting that lovely spot. I inserted a finger in the passage, and titillated her clitoris, which I found finally developed. My touches became more and more exciting, until I believed she was on the point of discharging, when she suddenly awoke and found herself in my arms. My instrument was rubbing against her thighs, but I had not effected an entrance. The charming girl, when she found the condition of affairs, took it in good part. She kissed me. However, we were so excited that we both discharged before the act of coition was effected. I now led her into the vestry room, near the pulpit, and, seating myself on a chair, pulled her on my knees. I unfastened her dress, and, exposing her two breasts, repeatedly kissed and handled them. I made her put one of her feet on the table, while her other leg hung between mine, by this means leaving her thighs stretched widely apart. I forced a finger into her slit, while she seized my instrument. I commenced moving my finger. She did the same with her hand, and in a few moments we again discharged, experiencing the most delicious sensations. After a little repose we recommenced. She longed for something more satisfying, and endeavoured to excite me. She seized my staff, covering and uncovering the ruby head. She even took the whole of my rod into her mouth, palpating it with her tongue, while at the same moment she tickled my testicles and bottom. Nor was I idle, for I pressed and kissed her bubbies, sucking the strawberry nipples, stroking down her belly and titillating her anus. I then kneeled down, and making her open her thighs widely apart, I inserted my tongue into her slit, titillating the sides of her vagina and sucking her clitoris. Helen was almost mad with the intensity of her desires, and was ready to spend again, when she had the satisfaction of seeing my instrument attain such an enormous size that when she again took it in her mouth, it filled it completely. Giving it a last kiss, she threw herself on a hassock, and pulling up all her clothes above her navel, thus leaving her body entirely naked from there downward, spreading her legs open and slightly bending her knees, she exclaimed, Come, love, embrace me well. Bury your staff into the deepest and most secret recesses of my body. Do not spare me. I did not have to be told twice, for I was on her in a moment. I gently introduced the head of my instrument between the lips of her slit, but it would not enter. It was in vain. I pushed. I could make no headway, but only gave her a great deal of pain. After a little trying of this nature, she was getting exhausted, and told me, for God's sake, to finish my work. I then withdrew my instrument, and wetting the end of it with spittle, again brought it to bear on the entrance of the abode of bliss. As soon as I got the head well between the lips, I began to shove. 
She was determined, however, to be aggressive with me, and with a tremendous heave of her bottom impaled herself to the hilt on my rod, so much so that the hair surrounding our genitals intermingled. She could not avoid shrieking out, but the pain soon began to pass off, and after a few more shoves she evidently began to experience the most delicious sensations. Every thrust I gave sent a liquid fire of delirium through her veins. When she felt my instrument rubbing the sensitive sides of her vagina, she appeared as if she would die with pleasure. Her breasts rose and fell, and her buttocks actually quivered with the delights of her sensations. My motion grew faster. My testicles tingled with delight at every shove against her bottom. She threw her legs about in confusion, and met every thrust more than halfway. She wiggled herself from side to side on my staff. The finale came. Herbert, I am coming. Oh, God, what pleasure! Dear Herbert, closer, closer, clo— She pantingly exclaimed, and a profuse discharge from the innermost recesses of her body met my own. We got up and adjusted our clothing, and I promised her I would visit her the next night in her own room, the access to which was very easy, and I returned home to reflect on all the pleasures I had experienced. Stop, Herbert, said Amy interrupting her brother-in-law in his recital. Before you continue your history, you must give me relief. Your descriptions are so voluptuous and lascivious that my slit is on fire. Come, darling, you are in fine condition. I seconded Amy's request, being no less excited myself. Herbert was indeed in splendid condition for performing the rites of Venus. We all rose from the couch. Stand up, Amy, said Herbert. Put one of your feet on this chair, and let the other rest on the ground. There, that's it. Now your plump thighs are widely separated, and I can manipulate your pretty little con. Oh, do, darling, returned the delighted girl. Now I'm going to titillate your clitoris with my tongue, said Herbert. Amy placed herself in the position required. Herbert seated himself on the ground between her thighs, and brought his mouth in contact with her slit. He divided the lips of her bijou with his tongue, and forced it in and out of the rosy cavity. Amy, said Herbert, when he had indulged in this play a few moments, you have got the prettiest little con in the world. What soft down adorns this hallowed spot, what delicious folding lips, and what a sweet morsel is your clitoris. How glorious it is to enjoy you to one's heart's content. Just fancy this the first time you had ever come in contact with a man. Let me rehearse the scene. He would first of all play with your bubbies. He would press and kiss them, as I do now. He would suck these rosy nipples until he had excited you to the last degree. He would then grow bolder, but you must lie down for me to perform the scene properly. Amy threw her entire length on the divan while I watched with delighted eyes this delicious scene enjoying it as much as if I were the recipient instead of his beautiful sister-in-law. When he saw your delicious white belly, continued Herbert, he would shiver with delight and fasten his lips to it. Thus, and thus, he would then pass his hand backwards and forwards on this smooth white plane, and endeavour to peer into the mysteries seated below. In another moment his hand would invade your delicious little con, just as mine does now. His finger separates the lips, and he gently rubs your clitoris. You are mad with delight. You open your thighs and wriggle your bottom under his touches. He pushes one of his fingers into your con and moves it in and out, as I do now. Oh, darling, it is too much. I cannot bear it, cried the delighted girl, writhing and wriggling her body about in the most delicious manner possible, at the same time seizing Herbert's staff and rubbing it up and down. Having toyed with each other some time, continued Herbert, he suddenly fixes his lips on your delicate slit, and pushes his tongue between the lips, and while thus employed he tickles your bottom. You are just ready to spend, and beg him for heaven's sake to finish with you. He divides your thighs as I do now, and mounts you in this manner." Herbert suited the action to the word, and threw himself on Amy's belly. She herself guided his instrument into her coral sheath, and they both commenced the work of thrust and heave. Delicious. Splendid! exclaimed Amy. I can feel your lovely instrument in my vagina. Go on, go on. He moves his bottom as I do mine, and soon discharges as I do now. My darling girl, your lovely slit has extracted the last drop from me. I too, 
gasped Amy. There, there. I was so excited at witnessing this voluptuous scene that I was obliged to give myself relief by rubbing my clitoris. I emitted at the same moment they did. What delight I have enjoyed, said Amy when she had somewhat recovered. But continue your history, dear Herbert. Herbert recommenced in the terms to be found in the next chapter. End of Volume 1, Chapter 5— Volume 2, Chapter 1 of The Life and Amours of the Beautiful, Gay, and Dashing Kate Percival, The Belle of the Delaware. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Life and Amours of Kate Percival, written by herself. Volume 2, Chapter 1. Herbert Clarence's History Continued I was punctual to the moment with my engagement with the beautiful Helen, and the moment I saw her I rushed into her arms. I then proceeded to strip her of her clothes, and she did the same office for me. I made her sit naked as she was on my knee, and began kissing her body all over, caressing her breasts and sucking the rosy tips surmounting them. I descended to her belly, smoothing it with my hand, and then I attacked the very centre of pleasure, first putting in one finger and then another, and twisting the hair surrounding her mount. I then made her stand with her legs apart, and I kneeled before her and put my tongue into the coral passage, giving her intense pleasure. I seized her clitoris between my lips, at the same time titillating the inside of her con with my finger. I thought she would expire with delight. I stroked down her thighs with my hands. I then made her stoop forward, by which means she exposed her handsome buttocks completely to my gaze. I slapped them with my hand until they were as red as a cherry. This was too much for me, for making her lean with her head on the bed, I had a fine opportunity to enter her from the rear. I was on her in a moment. I felt her warm buttocks rubbing against my belly, while my instrument entered a prodigious way into her body and I commenced my movements. At every push I made, I could feel my testicles strike against her bottom. My hands, at the same time, were passed round her body. With one hand I handled her breasts, with the other I rubbed the top of her slit. The pleasure was so great that it could not last, and we both actually swooned away when the crisis came, I falling all my length on her back, and she falling on her belly on the bed. A few minutes' repose served to renew our energies. I now placed a large cushion on the bed, and, taking her in my arms, I made her recline against it, in such a way that I could easily enter her body, while in a standing position. She passed one arm around my neck, the other around my body, and her two breasts beat against my chest. My instrument was soon buried in her glowing sheath. I pushed vigorously, and her breasts rebounded, quivered with the shock. Even our very hair intermingled. She was beyond herself and could continue her passion no longer, but opening her thighs to the utmost extent she discharged, and I did the same, her pleasures being a hundred times increased as she felt the warm liquor rushing into her womb. We soon recovered ourselves. This time I seated myself on the bed and drew her naked as she was onto my knees. How delicious was the sensation of her warm bottom to my thighs! She impaled herself on the object of her divinity. She now moved herself rapidly up and down, but I did not let her finish in this manner, but turning her around with her face towards me, I carried her to a sofa and lay panting and heaving on her bosom. She began to wriggle her bottom again, and in a few moments we again dissolved in bliss. The time had now arrived for us to separate, and hurriedly dressing ourselves we bade an affectionate farewell to each other. I never saw Helen after this, for my uncle died suddenly, leaving me his heir, and Helen was married shortly after, and went south to live. Soon after coming into my uncle's estate, I moved to New York, and took up my residence at the St. Nicholas Hotel, determined to see a little life before settling down as a steady man. I had been at the hotel but a few days when I made the acquaintance of a gentleman about my own age 
His name was George Darville, and he was a first-class fellow. In the course of conversation we struck on subjects of an amorous character, and I soon discovered that my friend was no novice in the field of Venus. That same evening we went together to Niblo's garden, and took our places in the parquet. Just before the curtain rose I stood up from my seat to gaze around the house. My eyes were immediately arrested by a beautiful girl stationed in one of the private boxes. She was the most perfect blonde I had ever seen. Her hair was a glossy auburn, and shaded a face that might have served for the model of Titian's Venus. Her features were regular, her eyes a deep blue shaded by long eyelashes, which gave a dreamy expression to her lovely countenance. Her lips were full and sensuous. A lovely carnation hue, evidently nature's own colouring, adorned her soft velvet cheek. Her neck and shoulders, for she wore a low-necked dress, were as white as Parian marble, and her bust was full and voluptuous. I immediately turned to George and asked him if he knew her. "'Why, that's Harriet Wells,' said he. "'The most lascivious woman in all New York. She does nothing in the common way, not even the act of sexual intercourse. She is a young girl of immense fortune, and puts no restraint on her passions. But come with me, and I will introduce you to her. I am in favor with her just now, and perhaps we may get an invitation to supper. If we do, I can tell you we will see a scene that you will remember to the longest day of your life. We immediately proceeded to the box where the beautiful girl was seated. She received us with a charming smile, and I was soon on terms of the closest intimacy with her. After we had conversed for about a quarter of an hour, she whispered something to George, to which he made the reply, All right. She then turned to me and asked me to sup with her that evening, after the play was over. To this invitation I gave a willing assent. The first act of the play was over, and the curtain rose for the second. What a dull piece, said Harriet. Let us retire to the rear of the box, where we shall not be seen by the audience. We can then converse with more freedom. I dare say you don't care about seeing the play, Mr. Clarence. Not at all, I replied. I would a thousand times rather converse with you than see the finest play in the world. That's a very pretty compliment, said she, rising from her chair and taking up her position at the back of the box, where I followed her. George now excused himself and said that he would return when the piece was ended, leaving me alone with Harriet. In the position we had taken, no one could see us, neither from the stage nor from the theatre. When we were alone, I put my arms round the lovely girl's waist, and, drawing her towards me, imprinted a moist kiss on her soft, dewy lips, and then begged her pardon for my boldness. "'There is no apology necessary,' said Harriet. "'I like it as much as you do yourself, and I like men to be bold.' She then kissed me of her own accord, and I could even feel her tongue penetrate my lips, while a deep flush of desire suffused her face. Thus encouraged, I grew more bold and placed my hand on her white shoulders. I gently let it slide down inside the front of her dress, and it came in contact with her glorious bubbies. Of all the breasts I had ever felt, there were none could be compared with hers, so voluptuous, so white and so firm. I handled them at will, pressing them and pulling down her dress, exposing them to my ardent gaze. Harriet placed one of her feet on a chair, and placed her other leg across my lap. This movement raised her petticoats in such a manner that it showed me a considerable portion of her gloriously formed limbs. In a moment my hand was under her clothes, handling at will her lovely con. She stretched her thighs widely to assist me in my researches. Nay, more, she raised her petticoats with her own hand, and exposed to my delighted gaze the lovely domain of Venus. I frantically seized the beautiful girl, and stretching her length upon a settee, I strode over her, and forcing my head between her thighs, I kissed her mount over and over, while she nestled my rod between her breasts. I sought out her clitoris, which I easily found, for it was extremely largely developed, and began to titillate it with my tongue. Stop! cried Harriet, a convulsive shudder running through her system. You must reserve yourself for tonight. I now desisted, and we contented ourselves with feeling and touching only, until the piece was ended. 
Just before the conclusion of the play, Harriet sent a note to the green room, and informed me that she had invited two well-known actresses to sup with us. They were both beautiful girls, but more of them by and by. As we were leaving the theatre, George and the two actresses who had been invited found us, and we all proceeded to Harriet's house in her carriage. Miss Wells resided in a magnificent mansion on Fifth Avenue. When we entered I was struck with the elegance seen everywhere. The drawing-room especially claimed my attention. A delicious perfume was distilled in the atmosphere, and the brilliant gas-burners shed an effusion of light throughout the apartment. The most elegant furniture was spread through the chamber, consisting of canopies, sofas, and chairs of the most costly description. On the floor was spread a carpet so soft that the sound of footsteps was inaudible. The walls were a mass of mirrors extending from the ceiling to the floor, relieved here and there by magnificent paintings, representing woman's form in every attitude and every variety of costume. In fact, the most beautiful women could be seen, from those most simply clad to those without a particle of clothing to cover their nakedness. I was transported with the scene. I felt my blood boil in my veins with undefined desires. We all five sat down to a magnificent supper, and partook plentifully of champagne. The three girls looked beautiful in the evening costumes. They were all very lightly clad, revealing a considerable portion of their womanly charms. Their dresses were cut very low in the neck, revealing almost the whole of their lovely breasts. Their dresses, too, were of the thinnest description and allowed their voluptuous limbs to be distinctly traced through them. One of the actresses was named Ernestine, a beautiful girl of about twenty. The other was named Isabel, and was a year or two younger. After supper we entered a delicious boudoir, evidently fitted up purposely for performing the rites of Venus. We had no sooner entered the chamber than Harriet exclaimed, Come, ladies and gentlemen, you all know what we have come here for. Let's have no reserve. So saying, she deliberately pulled up her skirts above her navel, and, seating herself on the ground, stretched her thighs open to the widest extent, giving us a full view of her hidden charms. She then pulled me to her, and, unbuttoning my trousers, released my staff and began to kiss and embrace it, titillating the head of it with her tongue. Nor was this all. Ernestine also raised up her skirts and showed us her magnificently formed thighs and mons veneris, and, putting her arms round my neck, kissed me passionately. Isabel sat down before George, and, shaking her dress off from her shoulders, she nestled his staff between her lovely bubbies. Her petticoats, too, were elevated, so that we could see all the lower portion of her naked body. I glanced in the mirrors around the room, and beheld a glorious scene. First of all, there was the beautiful Harriet, with her milk-white thighs stretched widely apart, and her pouting bijou, covered with its downy moss, staring me right in the face. Then there was the charming Ernestine, with her luscious con rubbing against my thigh, while Isabel showed me her white buttocks, with the lips of her slit peeping between the posterior portion of her splendid thighs. Of course, the sight of these beauties fired my blood in such a manner that I was completely beside myself, and if Harriet had continued her titillations with her tongue a minute more, I must have omitted in her mouth. But she suddenly stopped. Let us all strip, she exclaimed. Our clothes are only in our way. We all seconded her motion, and in a few moments we were all as naked as we were born. Ye gods, what a glorious sight it was for me! Just imagine three beautiful women entirely naked before my eyes. Thighs, breasts, bellies, bottoms, cons, all merited my admiration, and deserved my embraces. I paid my devoir to all three without any distinction. Now it was Harriet's beautiful bubbies, now Ernestine's lovely bottom, and now Isabel's glorious slit. I kissed them all over, not even omitting their lovely mounts of Venus. Indeed, I can say with truth that before three minutes elapsed I had explored all three of their vaginas with my tongue, nor had they been passive spectators the while, for they paid back with interest on my person all that I did to them. They sucked my pego. They titillated my testicles. They forced their fingers into the trou de mon cul. Ernestine breathed on my belly, while Isabel slapped my buttocks. George went through exactly the same thing. The consequence was we were all inflamed to the highest degree. 
when harriet thought we were all sufficiently excited she raised her finger as a token for us to cease and exclaimed i proclaim myself the priestess of this assembly and shall take upon myself the ordering of all tableaux first of all i give as your motto voluptuousness lasciviousness and sexual enjoyment there must be no modesty no shamefacedness and everybody must obey the slightest of my commands let them be ever so outre i shall make use of the common words when referring to the organs of generation and shall expect everyone else to do the same i shall still continue to use the french words but you must understand that whenever i do so the english common words were used by harriet and her companions and now to begin continued harriet fond as i am of being embraced by a man i like almost equally well to receive the embraces of my own sex and still more to see others performing the desired act of copulation she now sat down on a low sofa and stretched her thighs widely apart my first order is that ernestine shall kneel before me and fed my con with her delicious tongue and that while she is thus engaged mr clarence shall embrace her from behind while george shall satisfy isabel's pouting slit with his magnificent staff so close to me that i can feel them both when in the act we immediately began to work in the manner prescribed to us ernestine knelt down and fastened her head between harriet's lovely thighs and separating the lips of the latter's con with her finger and thumb she plunged her tongue into the coral cavity the position ernestine assumed caused her splendid bottom to be elevated in the air and between the cheeks of her buttocks i could plainly discern the luscious lips of her con in a moment i was behind and pointing my staff it was quickly embedded in her warm vagina the lips of her sheath clasping it like a glove george took isabel and placed her sitting on the sofa beside harriet the lovely girl raised her thighs in the air george rushed between them and his instrument pierced her to the quick harriet clapped her hand as a signal that we were to commence and we all began to push for the very life harriet by means of the mirror had the whole voluptuous scene before her eyes while she felt ernestine's tongue in her salacious slit she could see my instrument enter in and out of the latter's con and saw also george's rod appear and disappear in isabel's beautiful body now more while the two latter were thus engaged our priestess stretched out her hand placed it underneath isabel's thighs and titillated their sexual organs while in the act of coition sometimes it would be the lovely girl's clitoris another time it would be her bottom and another george's pendants which she gently squeezed these touches had the effect of causing those two to go before we did i suddenly saw isabel's eyelids tremble she raised her white thighs high in the air while a convulsive shudder of delight ran through her whole body george's strokes now became faster and more furious his buttocks quivered and he fell palpitating on his companion's belly while a low cry from her announced that he had sent his fiery metal up to her very womb meeting her own emission on the way about a minute afterwards i felt ernestine's vagina embrace my penis tightly a convulsive trembling seized her bottom and she wiggled herself from side to side on my staff in another moment i had inundated her with my sperm while she discharged so copiously that it trickled down the inside of her beautiful thighs i too come said harriet seeing that we were all hors de combat and she elevated her buttocks and pressing her mount tightly to ernestine's face found relief in a shower of love's dew and then sank back exhausted on the sofa in a minute or two we all rose washed ourselves and were ready for another bout seat yourself on the sofa mr clarence said harriet i obeyed she came and sat on my lap and guided my stiff dart into the innermost recesses of her con she then leaned forward and making george sit on the other end of the sofa she took his staff between her magnificent breasts and squeezing them close together held it a tight prisoner there she now made isabel take her place by my side and ernestine sat next to george she then ordered us to place our hands on each of their cons we obeyed harriet had one of the most delicious bijoux in the world it was so tight and warm that it embraced my pego very closely 
I forced the middle finger of my right hand into Isabel's coral passage, while I titillated her clitoris with my thumb. With my other hand I tickled Harriet's bottom. George did the same for Ernestine, and we all moved together. I noticed that while George's staff was moving between her two bubbies, she frequently bent forward and titillated the ruby head of his rod with her tongue. All at once I saw the white seaman gush from his engine all over her white breasts, at the same moment that I shot my charge into Harriet's vagina and received Isabel's emission on my hand. Ernestine, too, almost at the same moment, bedewed George's fingers. This last engagement seemed rather to increase our sexual desires rather than to quench them. Acting according to the orders of our priestess, I sat myself on a chair before a large mirror. Isabel came and straddled my thighs, and Ernestine guided my engine into Isabel's lovely grotto. I cast my eyes in the glass, and had a splendid front view of my companion's thighs, notch, etc. I could see my staff embedded in her vagina, and had a distinct view of the luscious lips embracing it. The lovely girl was delighted to be so thoroughly gorged. Ernestine laid on her back exactly in front of us, and Harriet knelt down before her, and with her tongue titillated her clitoris, while George entered Harriet from behind. It was a magnificent sight to us, and we all soon emitted. We now partook of some spiced wine, which had the effect of entirely restoring our energies, and our rampant instruments proved that we were quite ready for another engagement in the courts of Venus. Harriet now ordered me to lie on my back on the floor, and pushed Ernestine on the top of me. My pego entered her con. Harriet began to tickle our genitals when we were thus joined, while George entered her en cool, at the same time passing his hand in front of her, and titillating her clitoris with his finger. With her unoccupied hand, Harriet took possession of Isabel's con, and forced two fingers in it, and in this manner we all again succumbed. I should tire you if I were to enumerate all the manners and modes in which we accomplished the sexual act. Suffice it to say that we kept it up until five o'clock the next morning, and only ceased from sheer inability to proceed further. During that time I had embraced three girls in every part of their bodies, en con, en cul, between the bubbies, the buttocks, and, in short, every portion of their bodies. I took a week's rest after this night's experience. My history is already too long, but I have one more adventure to describe, and then I have done. About a month after my adventure with Harriet Wells, I received a note from an aunt of mine, who kept a ladies' seminary in Westchester County, New York, asking me to come and spend a month with her. Having no particular business to attend to, I determined to accept this invitation, thinking perhaps I might meet with some adventures among so many young girls, beside which I knew that my aunt had a very pretty daughter, and I thought perhaps she and I might become better acquainted. In a few hours I was at my aunt's door, and was received with the utmost cordiality by my aunt. I had scarcely entered the drawing-room before my cousin Emmeline made her appearance. The moment I cast my eyes upon her, I was almost struck dumb with surprise, for she was so much more beautiful than I had expected to find her. It was at least ten years since I had seen her. She was at that time twelve years old, and promised to be very pretty but I never expected to see such an embodiment of female loveliness as now appeared. My cousin Emmeline was twenty-two years of age. She was tall, stately, and voluptuously formed. Her face was perfectly oval, and her features were regular almost to a fault. Her hair, which was very abundant, was a dark glossy brown, and fell in massive bands on a neck as white and pure as alabaster. Her eyes were dark and flashing, and shrouded with long eyelashes, while her figure was perfect. She was dressed en negligé, but through her morning wrapper I could trace the round form of her voluptuous bust. She received me with the utmost frankness, and made no objection to the kiss that I imprinted on her ruby lips, with a cousin's liberty. During her temporary absence from the room, her mother informed me that she was to be married in three weeks to a very rich gentleman who was a good deal older than herself, and for whom she did not profess any deep attachment. In the afternoon I was ushered into the schoolroom, 
and found myself surrounded by thirty or forty beautiful girls of all ages and styles of loveliness. Some of them were excessively beautiful, and all cast on me curious glances, as if they wondered what my business could be there. In the evening my aunt, cousin, and myself met in the drawing-room, and the evening was passed with music, singing, and conversation. If Emmeline looked beautiful in a morning costume, she was perfectly lovely in evening dress. She wore her frock cut so low in the neck that the contours of her lovely bust could be plainly seen. In fact, while she was performing on the piano, I bent over her for the purpose of turning the leaves of her music, and as she bent forward I had a most distinct view of the two white semi-globes of her bosom. They were separated by a white valley which led to other hidden charms. The sight of her delicious bubbies so excited me that I was compelled to hold my pocket-handkerchief in front of me to hide the protuberance produced by her charms. Several days passed, during which time I attempted to take several liberties with my cousin, but she always stopped me at a certain point, no doubt actuated by the fact of her approaching marriage. I was in despair, for I saw no way of accomplishing my designs. The thought struck me, however, that if I could only succeed in exciting her passions, I might move her to my will. I determined to make my attempt. I had in my stock amorous books, one in French, entitled L'Académie des Dames, an exceedingly lascivious work, interspersed with the most magnificent engravings. It was something like Aretino's favourite Putanti Errante, but much more full and complete. It purported to be a dialogue between two young girls, and gave the fullest information in all sexual matters, interspersed with vivid and glowing descriptions of the sexual act. This book I stealthily lay in my cousin's way, as if I had left it there by accident. I rejoiced to find, half an hour afterwards, on returning to the place where I had put it, that it was gone, and I had no doubt but that it had fallen into Emmeline's hands. The house in which my aunt resided was an old-fashioned building, containing very large rooms, all communicating with each other. The bedroom allotted to me was situated next to Emmeline's chamber, and there was a communication between the two apartments by means of a closet, which served for both rooms. This closet was only divided by a green curtain. I retired to bed very early that night, and the first thing I did was to cut a hole in the curtain, and leave my side of the closet door open. I then put out my light, and waited for events. I had not to wait long, for I soon heard Emmeline's light step ascending the stairs. I had only just taken my position in the closet, when she entered the chamber. As luck would have it, she did not close her closet door, but immediately began to undress. Great God! What beauties she revealed to me as she removed her garments, one by one! First it was her beautiful shoulders, next her voluptuous limbs, and lastly her resplendent bosom, for when she stood in her chemise I had a full view of her naked bubbies. No words that I can utter can give the faintest idea of the glories of their form and beauty. They were beyond comparison. She now went to her trunk, and took from it a book, which I discovered in a moment to be l'Académie des Dames, and then she threw herself, lightly clad as she was, upon the bed. Her couch was placed exactly opposite my hiding-place, so that I had a most perfect view of her as she reclined there. One of her milk-white breasts was entirely bare, and her chemise was raised sufficiently high for me to see a portion of her lovely thighs. She began to read, and soon I saw a strange change take place in her. Her face grew flushed, her bosom heaved, and she began to twist her legs and thighs about in a curious manner. Suddenly, without any previous intimation of her intention, she seized the lower end of her chemise and slowly raised it above her navel. By this action all her hidden charms were entirely exposed to me. Heavens! I glanced on the picture. Imagination cannot paint the delicious sight that met my eyes. Her con was one of the loveliest I had ever beheld. I could distinctly trace the two pouting lips through a forest of umbrageous covering while her white belly, her delicious thighs, and voluptuous breast formed the adjuncts to a picture which I feel it is in vain for me to attempt to describe. 
the lovely emmeline still continued reading little suspecting that prying eyes were eagerly devouring her most secret charms she held the book in her left hand her right fell carelessly by her side her fingers coming in contact with the hair surrounding her mons veneris a shiver ran through her system when she felt the place on which her hand had fallen and she instinctively raised up her thighs to admit more easily her researches into her own beauties the book had evidently grown now quite interesting for i saw the middle finger of her hand slowly separate the pouting lips of her bijou to find a refuge in her warm vagina she now began to move it in and out slowly at first it appeared to fit very tightly for every onward motion brought out the myphi and they disappeared again when the deflowering finger advanced inwards these titillations were more than the lovely girl could bear for she threw away the book and set earnestly about giving herself relief her fingers now moved with lightning rapidity in and out of her vagina while with her thumb she titillated her clitoris by heavens she's about to come i can read it in the voluptuous motions of her charming body i can read it in the frantic motion of her finger and in the twitching of her eyelids there dear girl now it flows there there the acme was reached and she fainted away i was so excited by what i had seen that regardless of consequences i rushed into my cousin's bedchamber she did not hear me for she had not yet recovered her consciousness i pulled out my pocket handkerchief and wiped her lovely bijou perfectly dry i then knelt down by the side of the bed and tenderly kissed the theatre of her pleasures the warmth of my embrace doubtless recalled her to herself for she opened her eyes and gazed on me the moment she saw me she uttered a faint scream hush dear emmeline i exclaimed it is i your cousin herbert after what i have seen all further reserve would be folly i love you my dear cousin and must enjoy your beautiful body no one need know anything about it promise to conceal what you have seen this night and you may do anything you please with me she replied i swear it i answered the beautiful girl no sooner heard me utter these words than she threw her arms round my neck and kissed me passionately i twined her beautiful limbs in mine and rolled her over on the bed i now laid on my back and turning her magnificent buttocks towards my face she guided my lance into her ruby cavity a slight upward motion on my part caused it to enter completely and i had the gratification of seeing my instrument enter in and out of her coral crevice during the act of coition emmeline when she felt my proud engine pierce her vitals was almost delirious with joy she knelt with my thighs between hers and in the delirium of pleasure convulsively grasped the bedclothes i felt that i was about to emit and finding that she was not quite ready to come i passed a hand round her hips and titillated her clitoris with my finger this had the effect of immediately bringing down her emission we both discharged together i have already my dear girls made my history too long or i could detain you for hours yet with an account of the various modes in which i enjoyed my cousin i could also tell you how i overcame the virtue of five of my aunt's eldest scholars and how one night we all enjoyed an orgy in my cousin emmeline's chamber but in such a relation i should necessarily have to repeat scenes i have already depicted so i forbear my cousin emmeline was married on the day appointed i returned home became acquainted with my present wife and was married some little time after my marriage i managed to get amy to accept my embraces i shall leave the details for her to tell amy blushed and would fain have been excused but we both insisted. Amy was not obdurate, and could not withstand our entreaties. She commenced her history in the terms which will be found in the next chapter. End of Volume 2, Chapter 1《Of the Life and Amours of the Beautiful, Gay, and Dashing Kate Percival, the Belle of the Delaware. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. The Life and Amours of Kate Percival, written by herself. Volume 2, Chapter 2, Amy Denmead's History. I was born in Philadelphia. My father was a large and successful merchant, doing business there. We lived in a large house in the upper part of Chestnut Street, and my father's wealth procured me every luxury that the heart could wish for. I never knew my mother, for she died when I was quite young. My sister was married to you, Herbert, when I was seventeen years of age. My ideas up to that time were very vague regarding the sexes, but I was soon destined to be fully enlightened. I felt very dull after my sister had gone away, and my father proposed that I should write and ask my old schoolfellow, Florence Maltby, to come and stay on a visit with us. I cordially agreed to this proposition, for I loved Florence, and had not seen her for several years, although we kept up a constant correspondence. Florence accepted my invitation, and on the day agreed upon she took up her abode with us. Miss Maltby was a beautiful girl, about twenty years of age. Her hair and eyes were black. In fact, she was a decided brunette. She was fiery, impulsive, and amorous. We had a thousand things to converse about, and in a few hours all our old friendship was re -knit and we became more intimate than ever. Of course we slept together. For two or three nights nothing occurred of special moment. I noticed, however, that Florence would kiss me with a great deal of warmth, and press me tenderly in her arms when we were in bed together, but I thought nothing of it. One night, about a week after she had been an inmate of our house, when we retired to our chamber, instead of undressing as usual, Florence seated herself on the side of the bed and watched me in the process of disrobing. I had unhooked the front of my dress, and it had fallen on my shoulders, and my chemise, being open in the front, allowed my two breasts to be seen. Nay, even a portion of the white plain below was visible. Florence no sooner saw this than her eyes brightened, and she ran up to me and began to mould my boobies. Although this action somewhat surprised me, I made no resistance and to tell the truth, the contact of her soft hands on my breasts was very agreeable. "'What delicious breasts you have!' said Florence. "'How well formed they are, and yet how large! See how stiff the rosy nipples stand out from this field of snow! Oh, how I would love to kiss and press them!' And she buried her head between the two semi-globes. "'And then your belly! How soft and white it is!' She continued, passing her hand over it. How happy will the man be who presses that belly to his own? Oh, fie, Florence, you should not talk in that manner, I replied, my face flushing with the fire kindled in me by her lascivious touchings. But you exaggerate my beauties. It is true my breasts are a little larger than yours, but they are not one bit more handsome, more firm, nor more elastic. Come, dear, let us compare them for I do not see why I should not be gratified as well as yourself. I now unhooked Florence's dress, and pulled it down to her waist. Her two semi-globes were completely exposed. They were beautifully formed, firm, elastic, and standing boldly out from her chest. I pressed and caressed them, sucking the rosy nipples which stood out stiff with desire. <laughs> you naughty girl, said Florence. You will devour me. Your kisses send a fire through my veins, and these delicious globes, too. Could it be possible to see prettier boobies than these? I interrupted. Just see how stiff the nipples are. And then you talk of my belly. Look at yours. How deliciously smooth. How beautifully white. Come, darling, said Florence. Let us rub breasts together. I am sure it will give us mutual delight. I will do anything you wish, Florence, for I feel a strange fire burning in me. Come, love, come. We pulled down our clothes, as low as possible, so as to leave us a clear field. We then brought our chests together in such a way that our breasts rubbed against each other. To show how amorous we were, I need only say that this strange action gave us great delight. Is it not exquisite? said Florence. The sensations of your breast against mine fires my whole blood. I experience the same feelings, I returned. Oh, it is charming. Amy, said Florence, after a few minutes' repose, do you know what I would like to do? No. What? 
I should like to explore your more secret beauties. With all my heart, I replied, if you will allow me the same privilege. Willingly. I should love it, returned Florence. Come then, darling, I exclaimed. I am ready. Do with me as you like. <laughs> Dear girl, how good you are, returned Florence. Lie down with your belly on the bed, that I may admire and manipulate your beauties. That's right, darling. I threw myself on my face on the bed. Florence came behind me and, lifting up my petticoats, exposed my bottom to her gaze. Of course, she saw also the pouting lips of my bayou at the bottom of the fleshy cushions, faintly overshadowed with hair. She moved my thighs slightly apart, by which movements the lips of my sheath were slightly separated, revealing a line of coral between them. Florence absolutely threw herself on my bottom and devoured it with the most lascivious and ardent kisses. "'Does that position suit you, dear Florence?' said I, with my face buried in the bed. Mm, "'It is charming and delicious,' said Florence, moulding and pressing my buttocks. "'Great heavens! Amy, how the sight of your beauties fires me! What magnificent buttocks! How white and firm! How well developed!' And again she bent down and smothered them with kisses. "'I should never be tired kissing your lovely bottom,' she continued. "'And the edges of that dear little cleft I see between your thighs. "'How inviting it looks! "'How beautiful it is, shaded with silky down! "'Oh, I must! I must!' "'And she put her finger between the lips of my sheath "'and titillated my vagina. "'How charming! How delicious!' she repeated. "'Amy, I am in a blaze. My slit is on fire!' How deliciously tight your vagina clasped my finger, and what a delightful warmth is there. There! Now I have your clitoris. How stiff it is! Tearest Florence, I exclaimed, wiggling my buttocks, for the in-and-out motion of her finger was more than I could bear. Your touchings and titillations are bringing on a crisis. Stay the motion of your finger, or I shall come. There! There! There it is! Oh! I die! I die! During this last speech of mine I moved my buttocks up and down, imitating the conjugal act, Florence all the time continuing her manipulations, until the crisis came, and I fell motionless on my belly. "'Come, Amy,' said Florence, withdrawing her dripping finger from my sheath. "'For heaven's sake, give me relief, or I die.' I rose from my recumbent posture, and seizing Florence by the waist, pushed her on the bed. She fell on her back. I threw her petticoats over her head. This action revealed all the lower portion of Florence's body, and a beautiful sight it was. Two magnificently developed thighs led up to a charming grotto covered with black hair, between the pouting lips of which could be seen her clitoris. Stiff with intense desire, I admired for a moment Florence's beauties, and then commenced my manipulations. First of all, I stroked her belly, implanting kiss after kiss upon it. I then played with the hair covering her mons venerous, twisting my finger in and out of it. I then divided the lips of her sheath and titillated her highly excited clitoris. Great heavens, Florence, I exclaimed, what a beautiful bayou yours is, what delicious pouting lips, what a forest of black hair, and then your clitoris, how finely developed. Let me kiss it. Let me suck it. I now stooped down and inserted my tongue between the lips of Florence's ruby passage and titillated her clitoris with the tip of it. Great God, how delicious, I exclaimed. I feel ready to come again. I do indeed, darling. Amy, darling, keep on, keep on, said Florence, almost crazy with delight. Pass one hand behind and press my buttocks. I did as she desired, and advanced one finger in the narrow canal adjacent to the legitimate road, and kept time with my tongue and finger. There, that's it, she continued. I am coming. Oh, now, now, there, there, there. She opened her thighs to the widest extent, and lifted her legs high in the air. A convulsive shudder ran through her frame, and she discharged profusely, appearing to be perfectly annihilated by the deliciousness of her sensations. I threw myself by her side on the bed. After a long pause, we both rose and kissed each other tenderly. 
such was my first initiation in the sports of venus florence remained with us some months and scarcely a day passed that we did not enjoy the pleasures of the gods when she left us i was for a time disconsolate but soon after i received an invitation to visit herbert and my sister he has left it to me dear kate to give the history of my first amour with him i shall do so freely speaking as if he were not present i was received with the utmost kindness by my brother-in-law and truth compels me to state rogue that he is that he has always treated me with the most unvarying affection at the time of my visit my sister was very sick and i really pitied poor herbert that he was debarred from those sexual enjoyments of which i felt assured he was so fond but the thought of taking her place never for a moment entered my mind herbert was very polite to me and time passed very agreeably one day i stumbled in an obscure corner of the library on some amorous books i secured them and conveyed them to my chamber i then examined them and found that they contained pictures of a very lascivious character in fact men and women as naked as they were born were performing the sexual act i read them with avidity and they soon made me adept in sexual knowledge one evening when herbert had gone to philadelphia and my sister was confined to her chamber by sickness i entered the drawing-room with one of those prizes in my hand determined to enjoy it all myself i was in a state of delicious languor and throwing myself carelessly on the sofa began to read my book i wore a low-necked dress and the weather being warm i had unfastened two or three of the top loops thus leaving a considerable portion of my breasts exposed my dress too was disarranged at my feet revealing a considerable portion of my limbs as i read my cheeks became flushed my bosom heaved and i was altogether in a state propitious for an attack i was suddenly startled by the sound of a voice at my elbow what is the name of that book which seems to engross so much of your attention said the voice i raised my eyes and who should i see but herbert himself gazing on me with heightened colour and burning eyes it is too bad herbert i replied raising from my seat revealing by this moment a considerable portion of my legs nay i believe he even caught a glimpse of my thighs you ought not to come so stealthily into the room my dear girl you are wrong replied herbert i did not come here stealthily but it was your preoccupation which prevented you from hearing me enter but you have not yet replied to my question what book are you reading oh it is a stupid work i found in the library i have only just glanced at it and do not find it worth reading will you allow me to judge for myself my charming sister-in-law he replied taking a seat by my side no herbert i will not allow it i returned pressing the book to my bosom i insist he cried endeavouring to snatch the work from my hands in the struggle his hand came in contact with my bosom and he even touched the strawberry nipples surmounting the semi-globes at last he conquered and obtained possession of the book i looked imploringly at him but he opened it deliberately and read the title it was the memoirs of a woman of pleasure so so amy said he this is the subject of your studies is it i assure you i have not read a page of it it appears to me foolish and uninteresting and i was just about to return it to the library when you entered he knew that i did not tell the truth for i blushed and cast my eyes down on the ground he no longer hesitated but throwing his arms around me pressed his lips to mine and kissed me ardently i was astonished and confounded and endeavoured to escape him but he held me tight and pressed his breast to mine herbert herbert this is wrong let me go i beg of you he replied by pressing another kiss on my lips it was in vain i struggled he appeared to be endowed with the strength of hercules do have done i murmured between each embrace some one might come my love there is no cause for fear there is no one in the house but you and i your sister is confined to her chamber by sickness and i have given positive orders that i am not at home to anyone we are absolutely alone 
I could not disguise the pleasure that this news gave me, for my whole body became agitated with the warmth of his embraces, and my bosom palpitated against his. I even dared to return his caresses, and reimbursed with interest the kisses he gave me. Amy, I love and adore you, said he. Herbert, I love you, I love you, was the only reply that I could make. Again he pressed his lips to mine and sucked in my breath. He even inserted the end of his tongue in my mouth, and he met mine, which was as ardent as his own. I believe I should have died if nature had not given me relief at that moment. I believe the same thing happened to him, for he threw himself upon me, and two or three convulsive shudders ran through his system. He then became calmer, and reclined negligently in my arms. My beloved, this is true happiness, said he. Oh, that we could remain thus for ever, and that we might never part again. After a few moments' repose he rose up, and, leaning over me, seized one of my hands and felt my boobies with his unoccupied hand. The contact renewed the fire in his body, and his eyes reassumed their brilliance. When I felt his hand descend upon my breast, I shivered and made a pretense of snatching it away, but it was in vain. He cautiously unhooked my dress. I no longer restrained him. My frock fell off my shoulders, and my naked bust was entirely exposed to his view. He passed from one to the other of my ivory globes, as he called them, and moulded them with his hands, playing with the nipples and applying his lips to them, so that he almost sucked my life away. But he was not yet satisfied. He knelt down before me, and, placing his head between my boobies, began to play with my feet. I made but little resistance, and he began to raise my petticoats. He touched my legs, he reached my knees, and at last his hand came in contact with my fleshy thighs. He rested here a moment, and excited me by kisses. I trembled in his grasp like a leaf. My desires overcame me, and I was completely in his power. He then became more bold, and his agitated hand ascended the marble columns which would lead us to the centre of love. At last he reached my bayou, and ran his fingers in the down, covering that mossy spot. He even forced one more bold than the rest, between the lips, and gently rubbed my clitoris. It was too much for me. I opened my thighs to the widest capacity, and absolutely cried with pleasure. He then raised his head from my palpitating bosom, and applied his lips where he had just put his hand. He kissed my mons venerous a thousand times, and inserted his tongue between the folding lips. He again sought out my clitoris and played with it at will. But this could not continue long. I was absolutely drunk with delirious joy. Oh, what pleasure, I cried. Do what you will with me, my dear Herbert. His only reply was to divest himself of his clothes. He then performed the same office for me, and we were both naked as we were born. He turned me round and round. He patted my buttocks and caressed my body all over. My hands, too, were not idle. I seized his magnificent instrument and gently rubbed it and tickled his purse. We were both almost crazy. He then reclined me on the back of the sofa and threw himself on the top of me. I eagerly opened my thighs to receive him, and guided his fiery dart to the entrance of my con. He entered the lips, and met a little resistance, but was not to be conquered, for raising my buttocks I gave a sudden heave upwards, and his instrument was suddenly embedded in the sheath destined by nature to receive it. Then commenced the delicious movements. The motion was delightful. I looked around me and saw our naked bodies reflected in the mirrors. I could see his instrument entering in and out of my coral sheath. At last the consummation came. Oh, Herbert, I cried, I die, I die, closer, closer. Oh, thus muttering, I closed my eyes, my eyelids trembled, and with a convulsive movement I threw my legs around his loins and pressed him so tightly that I almost took away his breath. All was over, for I felt the essence of love rush into my thirsty womb, 
while I at the same moment poured down my share of Venus's libations. My hold relaxed, and we both fell all our lengths on the couch. After remaining without motion a few minutes, he kissed me again, for he was not yet satisfied. He soon rekindled my desires. He rose from the couch, and raising me up, placed me on its edge, and again commenced his labor of love. With one hand he raised one of my arms in the air, in such a manner as to leave my bosom entirely at his discretion. He took one of the nipples in his mouth, and pressed me to him with his other hand. My thighs were widely separated, and he had no difficulty in entering my vagina. He slightly bent his knees, and was soon buried in my grotto. How delicious was the sensation of his lovely engine rubbing against the sides of my vagina! I assisted him by every means in my power, and in a short time we were again inundated with our mutual emission. Such, my dear Kate, was the manner in which I first became carnally acquainted with Herbert. How many times we have enjoyed each other since, I need not tell you. But this, I do assure you, no other man has enjoyed me but Herbert, and as long as he is kind to me, no other shall. My history is ended. We thanked the charming girl for her confession. It was now getting daylight and almost time for us to separate. During Amy's recital we had partaken freely of spiced wine, and all of us felt almost as vigorous as ever. We decided we would not separate until we could enter the lists of love no more. Herbert brought a new auxiliary to our pleasures in the field, for going to a cupboard he took from it an india-rubber dildo which he strapped round Amy's waist. And placing me on my side on the couch, he made Amy insert the dildo into my vagina, while she put her finger on my clitoris and began to rub it, at the same time moving her buttocks as if she were a man. He then went behind me and entered me en coul. Amy acted her part splendidly. Herbert passed his hand over her bottom and inserted his finger in her sheath. Both Herbert and Amy moved together, and I had the delicious pleasure of enjoying a double embrace. Herbert's finger, too, was active, and we all discharged simultaneously. After we had recovered, we danced naked about the room. Herbert kissed our breasts, bottoms, and mounts. He placed his staff between our bubbies, he tickled our clitorises, and committed a thousand other follies. At last he lay down on the couch and pulled Amy on the top of him. She guided his instrument into her coral sheath and moved herself rapidly up and down, while I clapped her broad white bottom with my hand until they were cherry red, and while I was thus engaged Herbert's toe entered my slit, and in this manner we all again discharged. It would tire the reader to tell all the ways we adopted to arrive at the same result. Herbert embraced us en con, en coul, between the bubbies, between the buttocks, in fact in every possible mode, and we did not separate until we were thoroughly exhausted, and until the morning sun was several hours in the heavens. End of Volume 2, Chapter 2— Volume 2, Chapter 3 of the life and amours of the beautiful, gay, and dashing Kate Percival, the Belle of the Delaware. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Life and Amours of Kate Percival, written by herself. Volume 2, Chapter 3. A Change of Fortune. The very next day following our orgy, I received a letter from my father's lawyer, informing me of the death of my only surviving parent, at the same time informing me that he had left all his property to be divided equally between my brother and myself. His wealth was large, for his habits had been penurious, and I found myself the possessor of at least ten thousand dollars a year. This, of course, entirely altered my prospects in life and it was natural that I should immediately throw up my engagement as governess, and return home for the purpose of assisting the settlement of my father's affairs. I bade an affectionate farewell to Herbert and Amy, and even shed tears at parting with them. In due time I reached home. 
how still and quiet the place seemed my brother was abroad so that everything connected with the property was left to me i worked energetically and soon produced something like order i had been home about a week when i received another letter from my father's lawyer who resided in new york stating that my presence was absolutely required in that city to sign certain documents relative to my father's property and advising me to come at once i did not hesitate to obey his wishes and that same evening entered the cars for new york it was about six o'clock when we started and i took a seat in the rear end of the car for some miles i was alone but a young gentleman of about eighteen got into the car from a way station and sat down by my side i could see by the dim light that he was very polite and we had quite an agreeable conversation together by and by it grew quite dark for the lamp stationed in the middle of the car threw very little light where we sat our conversation grew more confidential i may even say affectionate the young gentleman grew somewhat bold and taking my hand pressed it in his the novelty of the situation and the fact that for ten days i had tasted no sexual pleasure rendered me oblivious to all resemblance of modesty and i allowed him to do as he pleased nay i even encouraged him for i allowed my hand to fall as if by accident on a certain protuberance in front of his pantaloons i had no sooner touched this sensitive spot than a shiver ran through him and he immediately retained my hand there as a prisoner all reserve now left him he had spread a shawl over our knees so that our actions could not be seen by the other passengers i suddenly felt the rogue dragging up my skirts and petticoats and in a few moments his hand was on my naked thigh he glided over it and his fingers came into contact with the hair covering my mons veneris he had already divided the lips of my coral cavity with his digits and was advancing one in the very centre of my vagina when the train entered philadelphia of course this put a stop to his progress and we were compelled to assume a decent position he was very attentive to me on the boat when we crossed the delaware but he had no opportunity to renew his enterprises at last we were safely seated in one of the camden and amboy railroad cars as luck would have it the car was very empty there not being more than two other persons in it besides ourselves we took our places as far from them as we could the young gentleman turned the seats so that he now sat opposite to me the train had not left the station a hundred yards before he commenced operations by making me rest my two feet in his seat one on each side of him so that he sat between my thighs he now raised my petticoats and amused himself by feeling my thighs bottom and slit he played with me for some minutes titillating the interior of my vagina with his finger pressing my thighs and tickling my bottom in the meantime i had released his instrument from its place of confinement and grasping it in my hand i covered and uncovered its red head and at the same time tickled his testicles after a little time he drew me to the very edge of the seat and pointing his rod entered my salacious slit after a few pushes which sent a thrill of delight through me he turned up all my clothes and regaled himself with the sight of his engine entering in and out of my coral sheath i responsively moved my buttocks in answer to his thrusts and in a few minutes we both discharged profusely four times did he thus embrace me during our journey from philadelphia to new york and four times did i pour down my libation of love's jew we parted the best of friends and from that day to this i have never seen him but the pleasure i enjoyed with him will never be effaced from my mind late the next day i called on mr ralph pitman my father's lawyer i found him to be a fine-looking man of about thirty-six years of age he was nearly six feet high and stout in proportion he appeared to be very strong and evidently enjoyed the most robust health he received me very warmly and i saw his fine eyes sparkle when he gazed on my womanly charms my business with him was soon concluded and it was decided that he should visit my late father's residence the ensuing week for the purpose of finally settling up his affairs i made up my mind that i would return home the next day as the city with all its noise and confusion was not agreeable to my taste the next morning i walked out on broadway for the purpose of making a few purchases 
when who should be the first person I met but Laura Castleton, my old teacher at B Seminary, and the first who initiated me in the delights of love. Laura was dressed in the height of fashion, and was as beautiful as ever. She recognized me immediately and kissed me affectionately. We immediately adjourned to Taylor's, where we could converse in private. I told her everything that had occurred to me since I had seen her, disguising nothing. Her eyes sparkled and her bottom heaved when I depicted all the love scenes I had gone through. "'And now, dear Laura,' said I, when I had finished, "'tell me what you are doing now.' "'I am the mistress of the head Maison de Joie, New York.' "'What?' I returned. "'Do you mean to tell me that you keep a house of that kind?' "'I do indeed, and a delightful time I have of it. "'How I should love to know its mysteries!' that you can easily do come and spend to-night with us you shall see everything without being seen yourself i have twenty-four magnificent girls living with me and every one of them will be gloriously embraced to-night you may depend upon it the rooms are so arranged that we can see everything that transpires in them say you'll come my dear i should love to only tell me where it is and at what hour i should come i live at number six thirty seven mercer street and come at seven o'clock i will be there you may depend on it soon after this we separated i made my purchases put off my departure until the next day and at the appointed hour i was at laura's door my old friend met me at the entrance you have just come in time said she for Horns Greenwood has just taken Olivia, one of the handsomest of my boarders, upstairs. She is from New Orleans, and one of the most lascivious girls I ever saw. I have no doubt we shall see some fun. So saying, she led me upstairs, and ushered me into a closet which communicated with the adjoining room. Olivia and her friend were already there. I was struck with the beauty of the couple. The girl had intensely black hair and eyes, the latter of which were lighted up with desire and passion. Her bust, which her low-necked dress allowed to be seen, was really magnificent. Her companion was a fine, handsome young fellow of twenty-two or twenty-three. "'Well, darling,' said Horace, pressing her voluptuous bosom close to him, "'I have come to see you again. The thoughts of once more tasting the delights of your lovely person has kept me in a continued state of excitement all day. My staff is in a state of the fiercest direction. Let me have oracular demonstrations of the fact, said Olivia, opening his pantaloons in front. Out jumped his member, stiff and erect as a poker. Oh, you bad boy, she continued, taking it in her hand and rubbing it up and down. How gloriously still you are. I must kiss you then, you bad child. So saying, she took his member in her mouth and rolled her tongue over it, at the same time tickling his testicles. "'Great God!' he cried. "'This is too much. I shall spend, dear girl, if you do not cease. All my blood is in a flame.' "'It is so delicious. I hate to give it up,' she returned, giving it a last kiss. "'But I am excited as much as yourself. Slip your hand underneath my petticoats and feel how stiff my clitoris is.' He lifted up her skirts and took possession of Olivia's luscious con with his hand, and evidently found the little sentinel as stiff and firm as his own lance, for I saw by his motions that he was rubbing it between his fingers. "'How delightful!' said Olivia, a shudder of delight running through her frame. "'It is too much. Stay. Let me open my thighs a little wider. There. That is much better. Now you can manipulate my slit a great deal easier.' What intense pleasure! Rub my clitoris harder and titillate the interior of my mount with your other finger. Yes, darling, I will, but your petticoats are in the way, replied Horace. I want to see my finger enter in and out of your luscious grotto. I will soon remedy that, she replied, lifting her petticoats above her navel, thus exposing her magnificent thighs, a portion of her white belly, and, above all, her delicious con. How beautifully you are made, dear Olivia, said Horace, devouring with his eyes the luscious sight before him. What a luscious belly, and then this masterpiece of nature, this splendid bushy mount. 
What words can I find to express its beauties? What fine silky down surrounds this luscious little con? How deliciously the lips pout, inviting a visitor! Let me examine the interior of this abode of happiness." So saying, Horace seated himself on the ground between Olivia's thighs. With the fingers of one hand he opened the lips of her slit and peered curiously into the ruby cavity. He passed the other hand behind her, molding and pressing her buttocks, even advancing one finger into the narrow passage adjacent to the haven of love. After continuing this play for a minute or two, he inserted his tongue between the lips of her bijou, titillated the interior of her grotto, sucking her clitoris. Olivia was almost mad with pleasure, and showed it by opening her thighs to the widest extent. When she felt his tongue come in contact with her clitoris, she experienced the acme of delight. "'Stop, dear Horace,' said Olivia, throwing her arms around his neck. "'Or I shall spend, I shall indeed. Oh, darling, darling, for heaven's sake, stop!' "'It is a hard matter to leave the interior of your luscious grotto,' said Horace, withdrawing his tongue from her slit and looking into her face. The sensitive folds of your vagina embrace my tongue so deliciously, and your clitoris is so beautiful that I hate to give it up. But, darling, let me see your beautiful boobies." "'How fond you are of moulding and pressing a woman's breasts,' returned Olivia, unhooking her dress and shaking it off her shoulders, thus exposing her magnificently developed semi-globes. "'Then here they are. Do what you like with them. See how stiff and firm the nipples stand out." Horace then began to toy with her breasts, moulding and pressing them, and then sucking their rosy nipples. While he was thus engaged, Olivia took possession of his staff of love, capping and uncapping its large ruby head. "'This is too beautiful,' said Horace, burying his head between her breasts. "'I can contain myself no longer. Come, dearest, let us perform the last act of love. I must embrace you. You see how eager my member is to enter your delicious con. I assure you, my slit is not less eager to receive it. Dear Horace, I burn for you. Come, my dear angel, come. Embrace me. Bury this delicious instrument into the deepest recesses of my vagina. Do not spare me. Push it into the very hilt. Make your testicles knock against my bottom. Come, darling, into me quick. See, I open the portals for you. There. Now you have a fair mark. Come, darling, come. While she was thus speaking, she half reclined herself on the sofa and opened her thighs to the widest extent. He then divided the lips of her salacious con with a finger of each hand and revealed the interior of that ruby grotto. Horace rushed between her thighs and, passing one arm around her neck, brought his instrument to the entrance of her slit. Olivia placed one of her feet on the table, standing close by the sofa, thus stretching her thighs as widely apart as possible. In another moment he was plunged to the very hilt in her body. "'There, girl, you have it now,' said Horace, when his instrument was clasped by the lips of her coral sheath. "'Oh, how deliciously warm your vagina is! Oh!' How tightly your lovely con clasps my penis, and your delicious belly, how soft it is! Your charming boobies, too, how delightfully they beat against my chest! Stay, I must suck the nectar from those rosy lips once more." He continued bending forward, and took one of the strawberry nipples in his mouth, at the same time continuing his energetic thrusts. "'There! How heavenly! How delicious! How exquisite!" "'It is too much, darling,' returned Olivia, throwing her legs around his loins. "'Closer, closer still. Look in the mirror and see how deliciously your penis fits my vagina. Stay. Let me raise my thighs a little. You will see it better then. There, now you see it. How lusciously it enters in and out of the coral cavity. Now I can see its ruby head. Now it is lost in the hair covering my mount. His strokes quickened. Oh, oh, I can stand no more. She continued, wiggling her buttocks. Dear love, I spend, I come, I come. 
Oh, oh. I, I too am coming. There, there, dear Olivia. Come, come. During this scene, their motions had increased rapidly. Horace giving violent thrusts, and Olivia meeting him with corresponding motions of her buttocks. As the climax approached, they seemed crazy with excitement, and at the moment of emission their legs and thighs mingled together in confusion. You may be sure that I was no passive inspector of this scene. During its continuance, Laura had taken possession of my mons veneris, and with her finger sought to give my excited feeling relief. At the moment of their discharge I too succumbed, and was so much overcome that I was compelled to sit down to catch my breath for a few minutes. When I had somewhat recovered I again took my station at the post to enjoy commanding a view of the chamber. Horace was now stretched lengthwise on the sofa. He was perfectly naked, and Olivia was lying on the top of him, also stark naked. His arm was passed around her loins, and he pressed her tightly against his belly. His left hand rested on her shoulder. Her mouth was fixed to his, and her breasts rested on his chest. Her thighs were stretched widely apart, and Horace's staff was so deeply embedded in Olivia's slit that the very hair of their genitals intermingled. They evidently experienced intense pleasure. Olivia's buttocks were elevated high in the air, and she moved them energetically. Every time she raised her bottom, I could see Horace's lance entering in and out of the lips of her bushy mount, and sometimes I could even see the rosy head of his dart as he plunged it again and again into her coral slit. This motion became more rapid, and soon the lips of Olivia's glorious con seemed to contract and embrace Horace's staff closely. She then gave two or three convulsive struggles, and ended by falling without motion on Horace's belly. At the same moment I saw the sperm trickle down her thighs. "'They have done for the night,' whispered Laura to me. "'Come with me, and I will show you something else. For I am very much mistaken if Rose has not a visitor by this time.' So saying we left our place of concealment, and entered a similar apartment at the other end of the corridor. We entered a closet in this room, and peeped through some cracks in the boarding into the next apartment. I saw a very pretty little plump girl entirely naked on her hands and knees on the bed, presenting her delicious white buttocks with her lovely slit, shaded with brown hair between them. Behind her was a tall, fine-looking man, about forty years of age, also naked. In his hand was a birch, with which he was gently tickling the lovely girl's bottom. "'What does this mean?' I asked of Laura. "'That girl you see there, Rose Monson,' she replied. Nothing gives her so much pleasure as to be soundly whipped on the bottom by her lover. They always begin in this way. Her companion is George Coulson, a very rich gentleman. But watch them, and you will see something amusing. I peeped again, and saw that George was using the rod a little more freely than when I had first looked. Already the cheeks of her buttocks were turned a rosy hue. His instrument was so stiff that it stood boldly up against his belly. Harder, George, murmured Rose, her face buried in the pillow. I scarcely feel it. Harder, my dear boy, flog me harder. George obeyed her wishes and let fall a shower of cuts on her plump backside. He continued this for a minute or two, when suddenly throwing down the rod he rushed to her, and to my surprise, instead of entering her by the legitimate road, he entered her en cool and, passing his hand in front of her, buried two of his fingers into her hairy mount. Every thrust of his buttocks sent his fingers deeper into her vagina, giving her intense delight. Suddenly I saw her put her hand between her own lily-white thighs and tickle his testicles. It immediately brought on an emission from both of them, and they sank exhausted on the bed. Laura now led me to another apartment, and again we took up our position. Here I saw a strong man standing in the middle of the room, holding in his arms a naked girl. Her arms were clasped around his neck, and her thighs around his hips. His instrument was buried to the very depth in her vagina. He had one hand clasped round her body, and the other supported her bottom. He moved her rapidly up and down. Every time he did so his staff entered in and out of her cavity, and in a few moments they both discharged. 
In the next chamber I saw a somewhat different scene. A beautiful girl, entirely naked, was seated on a low ottoman with her lovely thighs stretched widely apart. Her lover was kneeling on the floor before her and was caressing her lovely con with his tongue. I was so placed that I could see his organ of speech enter in and out of her ruby sheath, the lips of which appeared to caress it lovingly. This act alone was sufficient to make him discharge copiously at the same moment that his tongue made her dissolve in bliss. In another chamber a couple appeared to relish giving themselves manual pleasure instead of the act itself. For a lovely girl reclined on the bed with nothing but her chemise on, but still having her breasts and the lower portion of her body bare. Her companion lay by her side. He had his fingers embedded in her slit, while she had hold of his instrument. They moved their hands together while he had hold of her bubbies, and tickled her bottom with his other hand. A few rapid motions caused the sperm to fly from his staff, and he drew his finger dripping from her vagina at the same moment. Another couple had chosen a strange way to satisfy their desires. The girl lay with her head on a pillow near the edge of the bed. The man was behind her, and had passed her thighs around the upper part of his chest, supporting her belly with his hand. They were closely joined together. He appeared to be able to enter a prodigious way into her by this mode, her bottom almost touching his face. While he embraced her, he bent his head forward and kissed her buttocks. They both soon emitted. I saw a great many other couples, but as they were for the most part a repetition of what I have already described, I shall omit referring to them. I thought I had seen all, when I suddenly heard a ring at the bell, and almost immediately afterwards I heard a gentleman's voice say something in French in the hall. It is Alphonse de la Tour, said Laura. Now I shall have to show you something really worth seeing. He is the particular friend of Odoxy, the most beautiful girl in my whole establishment, and more amorous and lascivious than all of them put together. She is lately from France, and does not speak a word of English. She is perfectly crazy when enjoying the sexual act, and acts in the most preposterous manner. Her naked body is worth going a hundred miles to see. She is so gloriously beautiful. But come, let us get to her room first, for it is best not to miss the slightest preliminary of their love meeting. I was very curious to see this paragon, and followed Laura to her chamber which joined that of the French girl. We were soon installed in a convenient place of observation. We had been there but a few moments when Odoxie, followed by her lover Alphonse, made her appearance. At the first glance I cast on the girl, I was struck perfectly dumb at her surpassing loveliness. She was about nineteen years of age. Her face was perfectly oval, and her features as regular as if they belonged to a Grecian statue. Her complexion was a rich brown. Her hair was intensely black, and hung in a thousand little ringlets on her magnificently formed neck and shoulders. Her eyes were shaded with long black eyelashes. Her teeth were beautifully white and regular. Her arms might have formed a model for a sculptor, while her bust, which her low-necked dress allowed to be seen, was the most beautiful I had ever beheld. Imagine two lovely globes of snow which were so beautifully developed that they seemed to struggle to get free from the slight bonds that confined them. Every breath she drew caused those magnificent orbs to heave in sight. Her hips were fine, her figure magnificent, and her hands and feet excessively small. Her companion was a fine, handsome young man of about thirty. He was well made, evidently of a very amorous disposition. The moment they entered the chamber she ran up to her lover and, throwing herself in his arms, imprinted some hot kisses on his lips. I could even see her velvet organ of speech enter his mouth in search of his, and they remained for a moment glued together. Suddenly the amorous girl released one of her divine breasts from its bonds of confinement and pushed it forward for him to kiss. « Baiser mon téton, mon cher Alphonse, je meurs pour vous !» said she, and she herself slipped the rosy nipple in his mouth. While he was thus engaged she kissed his hair, his ears and forehead. « Oh, foutez-moi, foutez-moi, mon cher, mon con est en feu !» she exclaimed. And with that she began to tear off his clothes, and in a few moments he was quite naked. 
She then, with trembling fingers, began to disrobe herself, and every garment she took off only revealed new beauties. At last she stood with nothing on but her chemise. Roté, ma chemise, je suis si excitée que je ne le puis pas. Alphonse slipped her sole remaining garment over her head, and she stood in all her naked beauty before us. I had seen many naked women, but none to compare to Odoxie. She was grace, beauty, and voluptuousness combined. Her skin was dazzling white, her limbs models of beauty, her tapering legs, her plump thighs, her white belly, her magnificent buttocks, and her mount of Venus were the most magnificent objects I had ever beheld. The moment she was naked, she knelt down before the object of her adoration, the position she assumed slightly opening the lips of her slit and giving me a glimpse of the coral interior, and, taking his instrument in her hands, she nestled it between her breasts, and bending her head forward, kissed it again and again. She then rose to her feet again, and making him lie with his back on the bed, she kissed his whole body. Now it was his staff, now it was his testicles, now she even caressed his buttocks. She placed one of his feet against her mount, and, dividing the lips with her fingers, forced his toe into her coral sheath, and moved herself rapidly up and down on it. This curious proceeding was very exciting to behold, and her lascivious caresses caused Alphonse's instrument to assume a prodigious state of erection. Now she got on the top of him and, turning her bottom to his face, impaled herself on his staff. I saw its bulbous head distinctly separate the luscious lips of her slit, and then beheld it slowly disappear in her sensitive vagina. But she only kept it there for a minute, for jumping up again she placed it between the fleshy cushions of her buttocks, and holding it there with her hand, moved her bottom up and down. Then she suddenly turned around, and rubbed her white belly against it. Now she put it between her swelling thighs, now her armpit. In fact, there was no part of her body to which she did not conduct it. These manipulations were more than the young Frenchman could bear. He suddenly rose up, and pressing her palpitating body in his arm, he laid her on her back on the bed. She opened her lovely thighs to the widest extent, and revealed to him all the delights of the domain of Venus. How can I describe the spectacle that we saw from our hiding place? an eminence shaded with a mass of hair as black as jet, the beauties of which the most delicate pencil could not trace. In a moment he was between her magnificent thighs. Odoxy seized his member, and guided it into the delicious interior of her rosy con. It grasped his penis like a glove. Odoxy was almost wild with excitement. She breathed short, and her bubbies rose and fell in the most delicious confusion. Their images were reflected in the mirrors surrounding the apartment. It was a glorious sight. There lay Odoxy extended on the bed, her head reposing on the pillow, and her long hair streaming by the side of the bed. One of her legs rested on the ground, while the other was a little elevated, by this means extending her thighs to the widest capacity. Alphonse was between them, his staff buried in her con, with one of his hands moulding a globe of snow while the other was passed round her body. How delicious the contact appeared to be! He suddenly leaned forward and imprinted a thousand kisses on her lips. He then withdrew himself slowly from her, only, however, to plunge more deeply into the innermost recesses of her con. So delicious, so transporting, so celestial was the pleasure that they both felt that Odoxy threw her legs around his loins and pressed him closely to her, and they twisted and writhed in each other's arms. Odoxy suddenly exclaimed, Oh, ciel! Quel transport! Ah! 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 And finishing with a prolonged sigh, she poured down her tribute to the god of love, and then, with a few convulsive heaves of her divine bottom, she let go her hold and fainted away. He also emitted copiously and fell annihilated by her side. In a few moments they had both recovered. Odoxy wiped Alphonse perfectly dry, and her lover performed the same office for her. Neither of them appeared to be satisfied, for I could see that the Frenchman's instrument was still in a state of fierce erection, and Odoxy, by her touches and manipulations, proved that she was as amorous as ever. They now performed a strange action, which only shows how foolish young people can be when they sincerely love each other. Odoxy went to a cupboard and took from it a bottle of champagne. 
she now placed herself on the edge of the bed in a half-reclined position. Alphonse sat on the floor, with his head underneath her thighs so that his mouth came in contact with her hairy mount. Odoxy now uncorked the champagne, and, drinking a glass herself, she poured another glass on her belly in such a manner that it ran down to her slit and from there into Alphonse's mouth. He swallowed it with the greatest gusto, and the operation was continued until the bottle was empty. This sight, strange as it was, inflamed me wonderfully. The parties were so beautiful, and every portion of their bodies so scrupulously clean, that all disgust was removed. The bottle was no sooner empty than they again proceeded to satisfy their amorous desires. Alphonse lay on the ground, resting his head on a low stool. She straddled his face so that her mons veneris came in contact with his mouth. As she stood exactly opposite our place of concealment, we could see his tongue enter in and out of her luscious sheath. While he was fetting her con, he advanced a finger into the narrow passage adjacent to the legitimate road, and kept time with his tongue and finger. Every time his tongue came in contact with her clitoris, a convulsive shudder ran through her, and her bottom moved responsively to his titillations. At last they both succumbed, he from the force of imagination, and she from the actual contact of his organ of speech on her excited clitoris. It was now quite late, and after Alphonse had departed the house closed for the night. I bade my friend an affectionate farewell and returned to my hotel. The next day I started for home. End of Volume 2, Chapter 3《Volume Two, Chapter Four of the Life and Amours of the Beautiful, Gay, and Dashing Kate Percival, the Belle of the Delaware. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Life and Amours of Kate Percival, written by herself. Volume Two, Chapter Four My Father's Lawyer. When I arrived home I busied myself putting my father's papers in order, and was so absorbed by the occupation that not even an amorous thought entered my head. This took me a whole week, and I had only just finished when Mr. Ralph Pittman was announced. I received him very cordially, and treated him so freely that he soon felt quite at home. He had been there but two days when we so far understood each other that he ventured to kiss me. I made no resistance. From his manner of kissing I saw that he was of an excessively amorous temperament, and the fact that I had been ten days without indulgence in sexual pleasure made me very desirous of tasting his capabilities in the school of Venus. The next day I entered the library rather suddenly, and found my friend deeply engaged in a book. When he saw me he hastily endeavoured to conceal the volume. "'What are you reading, Mr. Pittman?' I asked. "'Something that I cannot show you, Miss Percival,' he replied. "'Nonsense,' I returned. "'You need not be afraid. I can look at anything.' "'You will not be angry or offended if I show you this book?' "'Certainly not. I wish to see it, and rest assured that whatever it may contain will neither offend me nor shock me.' "'Then take it, and judge for yourself,' he answered after a moment's pause, at the same time giving me a burning kiss which sent a thrill through me. I opened the book, and found it to be one of a most lascivious character, filled with amorous pictures. I gloated over these engravings, and felt my blood all on fire. The engravings were from steel plates, and represented the famous thirty-two positions of Aretino. As they were extremely curious, I will give a short description of them to the reader. Their titles were in French, and consisted of as follows. First, La Patte des Boues represented a man and woman standing face to face, with his instrument plunged deeply in her coral cavity. Second, la grue, the same position but with one of the legs raised in the air. Third, la porte de devant, represented a woman seated with a man standing between her thighs, her lustful crevice completely filled by his instrument, while her legs closely embraced his ribs. Fourth, le cheval fondu, represented a girl on her hands and knees, while a man was embracing her from behind, her head being reclined forward and her bottom elevated. 
Fifth, l'Allemande, the same position, with the addition that the man has his hands on her con. Sixth, la brebis, the same position, with the woman resting her hands on the ground. Seventh, faire des chandelles de suif, the girl seated across the thighs of the man. Eight, à l'arbre, the same position, but with the girl's legs raised, and with her feet placed against the man's buttocks. Ninth, l'enfant qui dort, the girl leaning against the man's stomach, her shoulders against his right arm, and her two legs resting on his right thigh. Tenth, l'entendu, the girl lying down on her back and the man standing between her thighs, embracing her in front, in which position he can see his instrument working in her con. Eleventh, au dos pressé, a girl seated on a man's thighs with her legs wrapped around his loins. Twelfth, cornus, the same position, where a man rests one of the girl's thighs on his arm and presses the other down against his buttock. Thirteenth, ce soir au col, the same position when he raises one leg in the air. Fourteenth, chaussebot, a man taking the two lips of the girl's con and drawing them on his penis. Fifteenth, courir la bague, a man running towards a girl with thighs extended to receive him, and in this manner inserting his instrument into her con. Sixteenth, à la plaine, the woman extended all her length on her back, with the man lying between her extended thighs. Seventeenth, à la grande nuit, the same position with the woman resting her feet on his heels. Eighteenth, la Jeannette, the man lying all his length on the top of a woman. Nineteenth, à l'andronette, when the girl stoops forward and the man embraces her in a standing posture from behind. Twentieth, au profil, a girl and her companion lying on their sides. Twenty-first, à la botte badine, the man with one of his legs resting on the woman's flank. Twenty-second, derrière en con, a woman lying with her back to a man, with one of her legs raised in the air. Twenty-third, riche en fleuve, the man lying across a woman belly to belly. Twenty-fourth, chevauché l'âne, the woman lying on the top of a man with his instrument in her con. Twenty-fifth, à la galère, the same position with her side turned to the man. Twenty-sixth, chevauché en baste, the woman lying across him. Twenty-seventh, à la moresque, the man seated on the bed with his legs open, the woman seated in the same position, but with her thighs resting on his. Twenty-eighth, au clistère, the girl with her bottom brought to the edge of the bed, separating her buttocks with her hands, and the man standing behind, embedded in the trou de son cul. Twenty-ninth, sonnet du cul, the woman seated on the edge of the bed with her feet resting against the wall, and during the act of coition she keeps raising one leg and lowering the other. Thirtieth, les jambes au col à la revêche, the woman lying on her face with her legs resting on the man's shoulders. Thirty-first, la cloche represented a man reclining on the ground, resting on his hands and feet, his belly uppermost, while the woman is seated in a basket without a bottom, so that her con comes through the open space to which was affixed a pulley, so that every time the rope was pulled it brought the woman's notch in contact with the man's penis, and the amorous combat is finished by continual pulling on the rope. Thirty-second, Branlet la pique represented a man with his finger in a girl's con, and by his touches making her discharge, while she was doing the same thing for him. In this manner they enjoyed pleasure without conjunction, either standing, sitting, or lying. When I cast my eyes on the magnificent plates, the color mounted to my face, and I involuntarily pressed my thighs closer together. Ah, Kate, said Ralph, again kissing me and forcing his tongue into my mouth. I perceive you are as fond of amorous sports as I am. I am delighted to make the discovery. I can foresee some delicious pleasures together. And he pressed my palpitating bosom to his, kissing me in the same manner as before. Dear Ralph, I replied, returning his caresses by imitating his actions, and advancing my tongue to meet his. I have already been initiated in the mysteries of love, and have determined henceforth to devote my whole life to its enjoyments. Bravely spoken, Kate, returned Ralph. But come, darling, take me into your bedchamber, and we will talk the matter over. I led the way into my own private room. I had caused it to be neatly furnished, and it was replete with every luxury. A carpet soft as velvet was spread on the floor, capacious sofas, soft and springy, just fitted for the performance of the conjugal act, were placed around the apartment. Immense mirrors adorned the walls, relieved by beautiful pictures. 
No light of day was permitted to enter this nest, but it was illuminated by means of brilliant gas-burners, and, to crown all, a perfume of the most intoxicating description was distilled through the atmosphere. When we entered this apartment, a delicious languor stole over me, and my amorous feelings were excited to an intense degree. I threw myself into Ralph's arms, squeezing, kissing, nay, even biting him. He returned my embraces with as much ardor as my own. I placed my hand outside his trousers and felt his stiff instrument. "'Stop, darling,' said he. "'These invidious clothes are in the way. I should love to feel your hand on my naked staff. So saying, he began to undress, and in a few moments he was entirely naked. It was glorious to see his manly form in a state of nature. I rushed to him, I kissed his naked body all over. He shivered in my arms, and I really believe he would have discharged had he not torn himself from my embrace. As for myself, I was on fire. The contact of his firm flesh sent a thrill of joy through my system and I had to exert the greatest control to prevent myself from pouring down the elixir of love. Now, Kate, said Ralph, it is nothing but fair that you should let me see you naked. Dearest Ralph, do with me as you will. My whole body is yours. Bless you, darling. I only hope I may be able to satisfy you to your heart's content. So saying, he actually tore off my clothes and reduced me to a perfect state of nudity. He then led me to a sofa and reclined me upon it. I never saw a man so amorous and lascivious as he was. Sexual enjoyment appeared to be a perfect passion with him. When he had placed me on the sofa, he stood a few feet off that he might better observe my naked beauties. "'Great God!' he exclaimed. "'What glorious beauty! How magnificently formed your body is, dear Kate! What a delicious bust! What glorious semi-globes! How firm and hard! And then your belly, how white and smooth! What well-developed thighs, what straight legs! And above all, that masterpiece of nature, your delicious con. Open your thighs a little, dear Kate, that I may get a better view of it. There, that's it. Now I can see it perfectly. How inviting the lips look amidst that mass of black hair! How closely they fold together, showing a line of coral between them! Oh, how I long to taste the sweets of that delicious grotto! Now, dear Kate, turn on your belly, and elevate your buttocks a little. There, that's it exactly. Great heavens! The back of the picture is even more glorious than the front. What a delicious bottom! How closely the cheeks come together! He now began to kiss what he had admired. He embraced my bubbies, my belly, my bottom, and the Mount of Venus. I could stand no more, but jumping up from the sofa I rushed into his arms and exclaimed, "'Dearest Ralph, give me relief or I shall die!' He pressed me to him. My bubbies came in contact with his chest, our bellies met. The contact of the warm flesh almost drove us mad. We squirmed and wiggled in each other's arms. We hugged, kissed, and bit each other. We rolled on the floor, interlacing our thighs. His staff touched my con the hair of our genitals intermingled. We rubbed our bubbies together. I rolled myself on the top of him and moved myself backwards and forwards. He placed a hand on each cheek of my bottom and pressed my hairy slit to his testicles. "'Great heavens!' I exclaimed. "'It is coming. Ralph, Ralph, I must spend. I must. I must.' "'Dearest Kate, I too—' "'There. Now it flows. Now. Now. Now.' A convulsive shudder ran through both our frames. We closed our eyes in the ecstasy of our sensations, and both discharged profusely, the divine liquor running from one to the other. All this had been effected without any actual conjunction. A few minutes' repose followed, and we recovered our energies. "'Kate, my darling,' said Ralph, "'lie down on the sofa again. I want to manipulate your charms a little more at my ease.' We were so carried away by our feelings that we discharged before we had sufficiently prolonged our pleasures. Let us be more prudent this time. Acting upon this wish, I threw myself on the sofa, and Ralph seated himself on an ottoman by my side, and commenced to excite me by his caresses. Fastening himself on the first instance on my breasts, he sucked my nipples, patted and moulded my bubbies, and tickled me under my arms. 
He was not satisfied with his tribute of admiration to my bust, but he straddled my chest and brought his instrument and testicles directly over my two ivory globes. He then lowered his bottom and rubbed his staff and pendants against soft cushions. Nay, more, he pressed my breasts closely together and nestled his engine between them. Great heavens, how these delicious touchings excited me! Nor was he less moved, for his buttocks actually quivered with delight. Kate, said he, how delicious your breasts feel to my pego! I could almost fancy it was its own proper nest. And he commenced to move his buttocks backwards and forwards. For heaven's sake, stop, Ralph, or I shall spend. I shall indeed, I exclaimed. I can feel the crisis approaching. So do I, darling, but it must not be yet. He then dismounted and took a seat by my side on the sofa and began to play with my belly. He stroked it, rubbed it backwards and forwards with his hands and tickled my navel. He then descended to my slit. There he made a full stop, and a convulsive thrill ran through his body when his hand came in contact with the bushy forest of dark auburn hair surrounding my mons veneris. He twined it in his fingers, gently pulling it, just to cause me the most pleasing titillation without giving me the slightest pain. He then invaded the sanctuary of love itself, and, gently dividing the lips of my bijou, cautiously advanced one finger into my vagina. After allowing it to rest there a few moments, he pushed it further in until it was wholly engulfed in my glowing passage. Oh, Kate! he exclaimed, moving his finger gently in and out of my slit. What a charming con you have! How tight it is! And only to think that I am to bury my staff in this lovely cavity. Darling, I replied, your lascivious touches almost take away my senses. He withdrew his finger from my vagina and carried it to the top of my slit and tickled my clitoris. There now, I have the little sentinel between my fingers. Heavens, how soft it is! He said, rubbing it gently. During these manipulations on his part, I was not idle, but paid him back in his own coin. I stroked down his belly and rubbed his staff in my hand, making him squirm and wriggle again. Had anyone peeped in the door at that moment, they would have seen a delicious spectacle. Such an observer would see a naked girl and man seated together on a sofa. Our faces were close together. Ralph had one arm round my neck, his hand resting on my left shoulder. The other arm was pressed underneath my right thigh, which was elevated in the air, and the finger and thumb of that hand were buried in my con, the lips of which clasped them tightly. His left leg rested on the ground while the other was placed on the sofa, thus stretching his thighs widely apart. I was engaged in rubbing his stiff member up and down with my left hand, and intense pleasure was painted on our faces. It would be impossible to find such a pretty little slit as yours, said he. It is a veritable bijou. There now, my finger is wholly inserted. He continued forcing his finger to the very hilt into my vagina, so much so that it actually touched the neck of my womb. How deliciously warm it feels! And it is so tight that when I withdraw I take with it the inner lips. Now, just fancy my finger a man's pego. Now it's in, now it's out. Now it's in, now it's out. Now— For heaven's sake, stop! I don't want to spend just yet. It is too delicious, I exclaimed. He then made me get up from my recumbent posture, and placing me in a standing position, put one of my feet on a chair, while the other foot rested on the ground. By this attitude my thighs were stretched widely apart, and my con was fully exposed to view. He then seated himself again on the ottoman between my legs. His face by this means just reached my mount. He commenced to bury his visage in the hair surrounding my slit. Darling Kate, he said, I must now taste the delights of your delicious con. I have felt it, played with it, but I have not yet performed the act which is the most delicious of all to me. Do with me as you will, I replied. I experience nothing but delight from your touchings. Push your belly a little forward. There, that's right. Now I have it exactly. So saying, he deliberately separated the lips of my slit with his tongue and worked it into the innermost recesses of my con. God, how delicious it felt! He then moved his tongue in and out, at the same time by scientific movement caressing my clitoris with his lips, giving me the most intense pleasure. 
I stood directly before a large mirror, and by looking into it saw a most delectable sight. There I stood in my nudity, my naked body borrowing roseate hues from the artificial light, and seated between my thighs, his face also turned towards the mirror, was the naked form of the handsome Ralph. I could see his tongue enter in and out of my coral sheath, while my breast rose and fell with the delights of my sensations. I could tell when his lips came in contact with my clitoris, not only by my sensations, but by the tremor and writhings of his thighs. His legs were widely open, and I could see reflected in the glass his glorious engine in a state of princely erection. The motion of his tongue increased. "'Darling Ralph, I'm going to spend. Harder, come, oh, come!' I could hold out no longer, but with a convulsive heaving of my whole body, I emitted a profusion of the elixir vitae. "'Kate, dear Kate!' exclaimed Ralph in an excited tone. "'I must have relief. I am in flames.' I clasped him in my arms, and, pushing him to the sofa, I made him place himself on his hands and knees, by which position his buttocks were elevated high in the air. Great God, how magnificent he looked thus! His splendid buttocks shone in the gaslight. Between his thighs I could see his magnificent pego all surrounded with hair, and the two well-developed pendants. I patted his buttocks, I separated the cheeks, and titillated the division between them. My fingers came in contact with Le Trou de Son Coul. I cautiously penetrated it and tickled the narrow canal, and kissed his bottom over and over again. When I had wrought him up to the highest pitch of desire, I proceeded with further operations. Open your thighs a little wider, dearest Ralph, so that I may get my head between them. You have given me the most ecstatic pleasure, and I am determined to do the same for you. Will that do? He answered, opening them to the widest extent. Beautifully, I returned, fixing my head in such a manner that the insides of each of his thighs rested against my cheeks. I laid on my back, and was so placed that my mouth came in direct contact with his splendid staff. In a moment I had taken his engine entirely in my mouth. I titillated the end of it with my tongue, and forced the foreskin backwards with my lips. It was too delicious. I was ready to spend again. "'Oh, how heavenly!' exclaimed Ralph. "'How beautiful, dear Kate! Titillate my anus!' I passed my hand behind him, and forced one of my fingers into the narrow way, moving it in and out, and keeping time with both my mouth and finger. I soon had the satisfaction of seeing the climax approach. He pressed his buttocks together. His muscles stiffened. "'Now I am coming! Now! Oh! Oh! Oh!' he exclaimed, and with a cry of pleasure he emitted profusely. When we had rested some little time, I went to a recess and took from it a delicious cordial, of which we both partook freely. It had the effect of completely restoring our energies. We commenced our touchings and titillations, and were soon in a glorious state of desire again. Kate, said Ralph, I am going to give you a glorious embracing, and if I don't make you spend as you have never spent before, I shall be very much deceived. I intend to treat your delicious little con to a delicate morsel. Now, Kate, on your back, open your thighs, and let me engulf my staff in your salacious slit. I laughed heartily and threw myself on my back. He was on the top of me in a moment, and in another second his pego was embedded in my con. It touched me to the quick, and I experienced intense pleasure. Ralph, while he was working his instrument in me, sucked my breasts and played with my belly, and just when I was about to spend, he placed his hand on the top of my slit and rubbed my clitoris. This finished the business, and with a cry of joy I again discharged, he at the same time pouring down his share of the nectar of Venus. This last bout appeared to arouse my amorous desires instead of quenching them, and I exclaimed in a frenzy, "'Ralph, will you do a favor for me? You know that flagellation increases amorous pleasures.' I want you to birch me on my bottom while I make myself come with a dildo. Get me a rod, dear Kate. I should like nothing better than to birch your naked buttocks. I went to a cupboard and procured from it a birch and a dildo. The former I handed to him. I then placed myself on my hands and knees on the sofa, thus elevating my bottom in the air. 
I then brought the dildo to bear on my coral sheath. It entered the lips, and in another moment it was plunged to the very hilt into my vagina. He placed himself behind me and began to lay the birch gently on my bottom. The skin turned a rosy hue, and I twisted and wriggled under this delectable excitement. I moved the dildo gently in and out of my con. "'Harder! Flog my bottom harder!' I exclaimed. He obeyed by letting fall a shower of stripes on my buttocks. The motion of the dildo in and out of my coral slit grew faster. I wiggled my buttocks. I am coming. My bubbies trembled. I was now working for my very life. The instrument moved in and out of my lustful sheath so quickly that its motion was no longer perceptible. Ralph, I spend, I die glorious, delicious, da, da. A convulsive shudder ran through my frame. The motion of my hand suddenly stopped, leaving the dildo still embedded in my con, and I fell flat on my belly without any sign of life. I was recalled to life again by the energetic thrusts of Ralph's instrument. Foreseeing my delirium, he could not restrain himself any longer but felt that he must share it. Before we separated we enjoyed each other several times more. The next day he returned to New York, and I saw him no more. I was now left entirely alone, but I was very busy, for the house was full of workmen embellishing the house and grounds. I have but a few more words to add. In due time all the improvements to the house were finished, and I began to feel very lonely. One winter's evening, just as I was about to retire to bed, I was startled by the ringing of the front doorbell, and almost immediately afterwards I was clasped in my cousin Harry Duval's arms. He had just returned from abroad. I shall draw a veil over the pleasures of that night, sufficient to say that Harry had become more dear to me than ever, and I paled before him in the art of giving sexual delight. The next week we were married, and since that time we have settled down into a quiet life. Neither Harry nor myself desire any change, and our existence has been fraught with every blessing. The confidence between us is so great that I have not hesitated to tell him my history. He has reposed the same confidence in me by telling me his, and some day I may perhaps give it to the reader. And now, dear reader, my task is done. I bid you an affectionate farewell. End of Volume 2, Chapter 4 End of The Life and Amours of the Beautiful, Gay, and Dashing Kate Percival, The Belle of the Delaware, Written by Herself Thanks for visiting Timeless Audiobooks. Please remember to like, comment, share and subscribe for our latest audiobook uploads.